Hey, it's time for another PCP interview. It's been God knows how long since the last one. Probably I don't like remember. A year and a half at least, right? Something yeah, they were all like done that. relatively within a reasonable time frame of each other, and then yeah. not ever again. Uh, and, and then I think Nate and Mumkey had one, but now it's your turn. Yes. And uh, you're fucking, who are you, motherfucker? Uh, I'm Tom Oliver, and I do 3D stuff mostly now. Tommy Oliver says. On Twitter. Tommy Oliver blogs. On the Tumblr. Tommy Oliver, what's your Instagram? Just uh, it's, it's Polystation, Polystation 2. 2. Yeah. And mm. then YouTube is Tommy Oliver says. Slee, C slash Tommy Oliver says. Anything happening on Facebook? Not yet, but I'm definitely going to move there eventually. What, uh, what you, I consider you sort of like, um, the reason that I, I, I think you're like a very uh, underappreciated, valuable asset to the PCP in a backroom sense that maybe even viewers wouldn't appreciate is that you know social media, like you know, you know what's big, you know what's hot, you know tech. Why? Why do you know all this shit? I'm just really interested in it. Um, I've just been interested in technology for my entire life. Like I remember like being a little kid when I was like, I got a Game Boy for the first time and I'm like, can I make this do anything else besides play games? Like oh. I was just really fascinated. Like I, I'm like, I'm super addicted to cell phones, but I wanted a cell phone before cell phones existed. Like I was the kid in like seventh grade who had no like actual life, but got a PDA, just thought it was cool to have a computer in my pocket. Mm -hmm. So everyone else like, and like everyone else was listening to like iPods and stuff. And I got a PDA and like got an SD card and put music on that. But also like I could play little video games and could do like things. And I was like, super interested in like the Dell pocket PCs that had like a little Wi-Fi dongle you could plug in and shit like this is so cool did you actually use your um, PDA to do like plan like planner shit like did you actually keep schedule on it or was I mean it mostly I didn't just to fuck around I didn't have a schedule but if I did right. I would have put it in there because I I never went for anything like that because I am so bad at like I love writing in a planner but I never look back at it you know what I mean? Like, I yeah. love writing a list of what I'm going to do today, and then I never look at it. And don't when I do it, though, it's super effective. Oh, my God. It can be. If you fucking, like, if you have scheduled time for videos and stuff, and you can, like, pre-produce them ahead of time, that's, like, my, a huge My big boost. thing, my hardest thing with production is that I can't start. As soon as I start, I get in the rhythm, and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. But I will, like, sit for, like, four hours and be like, should I do something? Oh, yeah. That's the hardest. I mean, once you're do once you're in it... The only thing that's going to push you out is if, like, you feel like this particular section is really soulless and you wish it wasn't even in your video, yeah. you know? Like, when you have those moments where you listen to a sentence and you're like, there is no way to make this creative and fun to watch right. that I am capable of. So I guess it's just going to be 30 seconds of footage from whatever show is relevant. And that's when you want to get up and take a break and go outside and... Uh, you know, not exist anymore. Exactly. No. That's me for the entire editing process, start to finish. Because as soon as I get to that point, like I've been doing the Y three D anime fail series. I did the first two. It's been written out since uh, I want to say maybe August of last year. Mm -hmm. All there, I have like this huge document. You read it. You read the whole thing pretty much. I sent it yeah. to you like a year ago. Well, which document? The Y three D anime fails. Like for each. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Was yeah. that that long ago? It was a long time ago. Oh fuck! It didn't feel like that long ago to me. Yeah, and uh, I just it just sits there because I don't want to edit it. Yeah, um, that video series. What? How hopeful were you that that was going to be like a huge hit? That one in particular, I didn't think it was going to be huge. I thought it was going to do way better than it did. Yeah, I thought so too. And I think that the only reason it didn't was like just uh just didn't get spread around enough and I, I honestly like i kind of wished you had just made it one big video i mean it probably just never would have gotten done if that had been the yeah, case yeah i'd still but, be working on it but like originally it was going to just be one big video yeah but i think the issue is that like because it's in smaller parts people were like interested but wanted to know more and then it took a long time before they learned anymore here's the thing i think there's three things the first thing is that my channel is dead. So, yeah, like, we just that, talked about how, like, only... You should, you should discuss that. So, explain this to me, because this is something that, um, you know, YouTubers are always trying to keep track of the algorithmic changes. Uh, Matt Pat's the only person who seems to completely understand it, but he does not yeah. reveal all, all He has secrets. a whole consulting business around it, so of right. course he's so not going to Right, so he's not going to just it. spill everything. 
Um, there's a lot of things we all know and that we all copy, but there's right. a lot of things we don't know that we have to theorize about. Like my theory that my turntable channel won't get promoted to music channels because it's only watched by my fans. So like you told me about this part of the algorithm none of us knew about and it's right. apparently happening to your channel. I think it's happening to everybody's channel. It's just like there's a lot of people complaining like no one's seeing my video or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I found out watching some videos. I've been doing a lot of research on Instagram because uh, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to use Instagram a lot now because I just like the platform. I think it suits my current work pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have every everything now has a has an algorithm and how it kind of like filters content and stuff. And they were talking about how on Instagram, the algorithm on Instagram is that uh, the most crucial window for your vid content on Instagram is the first hour. So depending on how well your content performs, how many likes it gets, how many comments it gets in right. the first 60 minutes is how it ranks for the rest of Because most people, when they open Instagram, just look at the first few things and then right. fuck off. If so you like if, if you people, I guess. If you get a bunch of like traffic on your post in the first uh, 60 minutes, it goes to the explore page. Mm -hmm. And then it also can get ranked in the hashtags. So like every hashtag on Instagram, it has the top nine posts oh, I see. for the day in the hashtag. So if you do really well, you can get pushed yeah. to there and then everybody sees it. And there's it. constant chances, not right. unlike Reddit. But yeah. unlike Reddit, it is it is self-promotion and not you having to like weirdly, yeah. circuitously only promote other people's content. Another really reason. interesting thing about Instagram is that the uh, how big the account is that likes your photo affects your photo as well. So okay. if you have like 500,000 oh, followers it's got a fucking... and you like a photo, it, b it boosts it because what it does is that... Um, there's also the explore page, so like if um, it's kind of like the search function in Instagram, but before mm -hmm. you search for anything, it just shows you a bunch of content it thinks you'll be interested in, and that's based on who you follow. Mm -hmm. So if you're an account that has 500,000 followers and you like my post and I have like 500, right. like a portion of your 500,000 followers will see the posts you liked in their explore page. Oh shit, is that how the, that's how Twitter works too with the likes then, right? I think it's or, similar or it's, to that. I think it has to do, I think on Twitter it has to do with how many interactions you've had with the person. Like if yeah. you interact with them a lot, it shows you more of their likes or something or, or if, I don't know if, like, I don't know what the fuck the logic is. I just yeah. hate it. I don't, I, I haven't, away. I haven't looked into Twitter's algorithm all that much. The only reason I even know about this YouTube thing is because I, they mentioned it in these Instagram videos. But for YouTube, it's not the first 60 minutes, it's the first 24 hours. And the first 24 hours only sends it out to 10% of your following. And depending on how well it does with that 10%, it'll either keep sending it out to the rest of your audience or drop it off completely and no one else will see it. Clarify what does it mean, your audience? Uh, so your subscribers. So like it, it's, it's public and anybody who like searches for terms and stuff can still see it. But it, you know how, like, because... But will it be different? Okay, so I get the sense that, okay, I've never, like, not seen a video in my feed. With the exception of, for some reason, exclusively Super Bunny Hop's channel and only this year, like, will not give me every video he does. Okay. But everyone else always has. But I think the reason is I only watch my subscriptions. Like, I consistently have, for years, only watched my subscriptions. And even when I leave my subscriptions tab, most of what it re recommends me is shit from channels I'm subscribed to. So I think maybe it just shows me... You're probably just because you're a highly active subscriber on all the channels you follow, so it knows right. you're going to watch them. And, like, the only times I ever... Uh, like, for a very long time, I've had people who will show up to my video and be like huh, somehow missed this, didn't show up in my feed, but, like, it would be only a couple of comments, and, like, most people seem to see it, and all the people who are regular subscribers see it. But, like, the people in my Discord, for instance, they are literally racing to see who can publish my video in the Discord first after it comes out. So YouTube, obviously, is just going to recommend them everything right. in their feed, but, like, I think if you have an account that's not like that, maybe there's more of a chance that, Yeah, it's, it's you know. I mean, they keep it all close to the chest, obviously. Right, because so someone like really... Nate, Nate doesn't even watch subscriptions. Like, he doesn't subscribe to channels. He just goes to them occasionally when he wants to watch their videos. That's weird. Yeah. Just, why does he do that? He just doesn't, like, use YouTube. Like, he doesn't, like, go there and and go to the subscriptions tab and see what the new videos are, like most people do. He'll go to trending and do that, or he'll go to, like, the homepage and just, like, watch some recommended stuff. I but use he the homepage mostly a lot, just... but I hate that I do it. 
I hate. I get sucked. It just never time. recommends me anything I want to watch. So uh, I've people have told me that if you do enough of the like, I don't want to see this button, it will eventually start to recommend you better stuff because mm. like it takes enough out of your pool of what it thinks you want. And uh, but I'm scared that if I do that for some of the channels I'm subscribed to, it'll just stop showing me that stuff in right. my subscription we box. So it's it's a total clusterfuck. But yeah, I think that's one of the reasons that the videos didn't do well is because of the 10% thing and my entire channel is just dead. Yeah, and because not that 10%, not enough of them are anime fans that they were going yeah. to So they're not going to click on it, so it's not going to get seen by yeah. anything else. Because a lot of times, because um, the first, so I ran a Twitter poll trying to figure shit. out what the fuck's up with it. Yeah. So the first poll I ran was, have, do you know that I've been posting regularly for the past 60, like, uh, like six months? 60% said no. And Twitter yeah. is where I post on the daily. So that's my most active people who know what I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. 60% of them didn't even know I had uploaded. Dude, I don't know if Twitter shows people all those YouTube links. Because, like, I've noticed that if well, I have a because, video auto... Do you want to know why? Why? Because Twitter has an algorithm now, too. Like, uh -huh. if you don't turn it off, it right. does show best first instead of a chronological feed. Yeah. So it's the same exact thing. And I've, I've noticed that, like... My videos, because I have all my channels set to just auto-tweet the videos when they come out. Because I right. make videos yeah. fucking constantly, and I want to fucking just have them do that. But um, I've noticed that those never get very many likes or retweets unless, like, there's a freak incident where if someone retweeted it, maybe a few people will. But if I, like, write out a tweet and put a link afterwards to the video, way bigger chance that people are actually going to interact I, with it's it. It's probably because Twitter I, – I, Twitter, I know Twitter actively doesn't like – you going to other platforms, especially dude, Instagram. I honestly think they're completely right to do that because there's lots of people on Twitter who the only reason I don't follow them is too much shit is linked to their Twitter. Like back in the day when everyone's Tumblr was linked to their Twitter and you'd follow somebody and it would just be links to their Tumblr and yeah. I, I would unfollow those people. I know. You um, know. I still follow some people who do that and it drives me insane. The worst thing is like Tumblr has an image preview and you don't realize it's Tumblr so you just click like, yeah. I want to see this picture and then it loads up a page and I instantly back up because I don't want to yeah. wait the fucking 10 years for this to load <laughs> yeah but like in, it, they i know twitter actively hates instagram because it doesn't if you have an instagram link it doesn't show an image preview at no. all because they don't want you going there no, yeah it's... so you have to like manually do all that shit but um i know I videos do really gonna... well on twitter if like you post a preview of the video uh -huh. because twitter is everyone's on the video kick right now so right. they want more video views on their platform so if you make if you take like a 30 second clip of your uh, your video and then you subtitle it so even if no one is because it, it's going to start auto playing yeah but it's not going to have any sound so if you can have subtitles that go with it so they can oh, see yeah, yeah. That's what the they're Facebook doing trick. yeah and then you have the link to youtube to watch the rest of it oh, that performs yeah, the best what... but that takes you know fucking yeah, effort it takes a long time to make all those but it i mean that's how the fucking that's how the facebookers Took over. I mean, another you know? something. If, if I get back into video hardcore, I'm gonna do that. You can just go on Fiverr and for like five bucks, just like do it. Well, like pay people to do it for yeah. you or something. I've been I've been looking on Fiverr a lot. I have so I have someone right now on Fiverr actually like managing my Instagram. It's not working very well, but <laughs> but just I'm just experimenting with shit. But how do you like? Can you set up like recurring payments on Fiverr, or are you just paying him every time he does whatever he does? I paid him. I, it was it was for it was a fifteen bucks for a seven day gig. And I he thought Fiverr was like only five. It starts at five, but it can go up to like hundreds or thousands of dollars, depending on what the services are. Mm. But um, yeah, it's it's. I originally went in there because I wanted someone to edit my videos, but nobody offers video edits like what I would need done. Like yeah. actually, like you know, you're not gonna go on there and find someone from fucking Bangladesh and be like, "Can you like edit in some footage from Hoseki no Kuni relevant to the narration <laughs> I'm talking about?" They're like, "What are you? What? No, you know, just it's not gonna happen." So. No. Oh, I think I might move this table forward and bring a couple of chairs over here yeah, because you're dying. this is uncomfortable as fuck. What did is you, your, what did, what is did your you... back like breaking on yeah, this? Yeah, but I I hunch all the time, so this is kind of like normal, like dealing with this pain. So I'm kind of I sit in like a fucking expensive office chair right. all day. Well, well, fuck uh, you and your right. money. Okay, <laughs> I can kind of deal with this. We should. Nah, never mind. I can sit up. It's fucking, this is real painful. I'm right. going to get those chairs. All anyway, right. you should talk about, um, tell me about your background in, uh, okay, 
I'm just going to skip to what I'm interested in, sure. and hopefully the audience will care too. That's fine. I want to know what everything about M. Dot Strange. Okay. Because this guy was like a huge influence on Massive, you. Massive, yeah. And especially now that you're doing 3D work, yeah. I think it's going to be something that maybe is more important to talk about than it was before for, for sure. you. So, um, first of all, who the fuck is M. Dot Strange? Why do I get these chairs? Sure. So, M. Dot Strange is a, uh, he's a YouTuber from, like, way back in the early days. But he's been creating content for fucking ever. Like, he, he, you, you, you dig deep into his stuff. He talks about, like, making short films. And to edit them, he busts out two VCRs and, like, cuts from one back to the other back and forth. Like, that's before that shit existed. Like, he got an iMac and, like, flipped his shit because now he can do digital editing. So, so this was, he's been making shit forever. Out of your fucking way. But yeah, he's a, uh, he's now, he's a, he's doing game design. But when I got into him back in 2006, he was. I was wondering what the hell he was actually doing now. Yeah, he's, um, I kind of like, like him less now just because like everybody does game design. Nobody makes mo- like fucking movies by themselves. So like, I feel like. Especially it's, like, not 3D movies. Less cool, but whatever. It's, it's still good. Um, I found him in 2006 because this was back when, uh, when YouTube wasn't a total clusterfuck and like the featured page actually had cool shit on it. Yeah. Like, do you remember when they had like the featured videos like on the front page? And, oh like, dude, I mean, back in the early days, like YouTube was like Freddy W and Epic Meal right. Time yeah. and like channels you watched because they were hilarious and cool and were doing something like of a caliber that stuff that was like made sense to be on YouTube, but was a caliber above what you expected from YouTube. You know, like, Freddie W's, like, Call of Duty in real life videos. It's like, you can't make this with a professional film studio because, like, it's fucking copyright infringement. And, like, and it's for gamers, a very niche audience who's mostly on YouTube, you know. But, like, it made sense there, and he did it so much better than what you expect that it was like, whoa. Yeah, it's crazy. And M. Dot Strange, I'm assuming, was part of that sort of era because his stuff yeah. is unbelievably impressive. So, like, the whole idea was because uh, what M. Dot was at the time and why I got into him is he's a 3D filmmaker, and he does independent 3D animated films. He did a trilogy of them in, like, under 10 years. Uh, probably fu- How long are they? They're... An hour and a half, two hours. That's fucking crazy. Yeah. And so they're full 3D and he does all of them by himself. Like he has voice actors and uh, his second film, he had someone <laughs> do the music for him. But other than that, everything. They look like if Tim Burton did reboot. Yeah. Like it's a good way of describing it. They're fucking crazy out there visually. Yeah. Uh, just all over the place. The first film was actually, he didn't know enough about 3D to do a straight up 3D film. Uh-huh. So it's mixed media. So there's stop motion puppetry. Uh, 3D, 2D, there's a bunch of cl- clashing medias that just kind of like stitch together in, in like After the, Effects. Like, kind of, better comparison, it looks a little bit like a 3D version of the Madoka Magica witch sequences. Yeah, especially bit, We Are the Strange yeah. is, is very, very much like that. But this was like years before that still. Yeah. But yeah, he, he'd been making films like live action and like music and stuff for 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 I think like the better part of two decades, even before that even hit. Mm-hmm. Cause he was like in his thirties when that started happening. Um, that's crazy. And, uh, he's, I love, I love hearing about people who didn't make it till their thirties. Yeah, I know. It's I, like the most I hopeful. still have hope. Yeah. yeah. So, so like, but like he went through a bunch of crazy shit and like, he had like a really messed up, fucked up childhood and like questionably, cause I, I've read like his books and stuff, like mm-hmm. maybe like sexual molestation and like crazy yeah. shit happened back in the day. Um, but, he was doing, like, live action stuff, and he would, like, dress up as, like, a robot and go out in San Jose and, like, just do chip tunes on the side of walk. Like, That's cool. As a guy named Agent A203, you can still look up that stuff. And, like, and just, like, had, like, a band just doing, like, this crazy stuff. And then he would just, uh, like, put out stuff on Craigslist. Like, we're sh- I'm shooting a movie this weekend. You want to be mm-hmm. in it? Come show up. And people would come just just make videos with random people. That's crazy. And he, like always had, like, this one homeless lady that he became friends with in all of his videos, and she was, like, kind of crazy. Like, he did this whole thing called the potato phone experiment with her. He just carved the word phone into a potato and, like, put her in a public place and just pretend you're on the phone and, like, make a scene. And he'd record it. <laughs> so she'd, like, go into, like, restaurants just talking into a potato. That's fucking hilarious. It's amazing. The guy's a fucking genius. But then he did, like, these three feature films all by himself. And I was glued to his production diaries because he just, like, was cranking it out. And he just, like, yeah, I bought, like, five computers 
Was he rich or like no. where did the money come from? Like he just like he Credit? just like got like the he just saved up like five grand and just like doing what? I I think when at that point I think he was doing like wedding photography or something like that or like okay. making wedding videos. So or he something. had like professional cameras and shit. Uh, you know I don't know because he doesn't talk at all about that side of his life at all. Like yeah. multiple times when he's done like Q and A things, I've asked like, "How do you live?" Yeah. That's what I'm interested in. And he always never, never, <laughs> never says anything. You know, anything. I think that's the hugest difference between, like, um, the way millennial artists are willing to talk about themselves and, like, the previous generation. Because, like, people, like, just above our age don't like to talk about how much they make at all. Yeah. They don't like to talk about, like, you know, um, who their influences are. Like, because they want to, like, people used to say, oh, I try not to have influences. I want to be original. And now everyone's just like, no, my influences are why I make any right. money. Is yeah. that, you know, like, nobody would have played fucking Undertale if you didn't tell people, like, oh, it's like Earthbound. But, right. like, you yeah. know, it's good. It's good for it's marketing. It's like Earthbound and Homestuck combined. Yeah, it's good stuff. So, well, I guess Homestuck is already Earthbound, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> point, point being, like, that, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's just like a difference in perspective and like for our generation we grew up with YouTubers who will like tell us everything about like ever since Game Grumps, you know, I feel like it's been passe for YouTubers to talk about like, yeah, we make a career out of this and like here's how good of a living we could have and here we went to Disney World today on the back of the fucking Game Grumps one episode of Game Grumps, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking crazy. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean the guy, the guys, he's like open, but like for some reason, just like how he makes money. I almost feel like it's probably because like he doesn't want to admit that like this doesn't make him a fuck ton of money. Almost, even though yeah. it's painfully obvious. I mean, why would it? Like, I think the most this like it's weird. The most disturbing aspect of my entire life creatively was like when I was like knee deep in like the pony stuff, and I went to check on M Dot, and I realized I had more subs than him. Yeah. I like almost killed myself. I was oh, like, boy. this is not. Like, the world is fucked and we're that never going to recover. That was how I felt when I fucking passed any of the artists I liked. Like, I remember passing, like, the band Clipping. I remember passing... I passed, like, Chance the Rapper in his early days. Now he's huge. But, right. like, um, like I mean, not even early days. Like, when Acid Rapid come out. He was blowing up. But I blew up a little faster. <laughs> On YouTube, at least. Um, obviously not in, like, album sales or anything. But... Yeah, I was passing a bunch of my favorite artists and I was like really upset about it because I was like, these people are way better than me. Like even at the time when I was making the pony content, I did not consider it like great art. No. You know, I was just like, this is just something I do because people are willing to pay me for something I want to do. Yeah, it was just you a know? fun little distraction. But it, it had turned into something. Yeah, and like it when it became like, okay, this is just a job now, that was when it was like, we need to consider ending this you yeah. know regardless of what it means for our careers which i mean god could we still we could still be making money if we were still pony people we could probably be making more i don't know because if there's I could less make as there's less people now. there's like, less people to go around like you don't understand like there is still a core fervent amount of people knee deep in that like my buddy matt it's crazy he still does like art like porn art for that and his YCHs like go for oh, like you 350 mean a DB or more. Pony? Yeah. yeah. Like $350 for like a YCH. What the fuck? And it's just like, oh my God. I mean, that's why a lot of those people are in there is they can't leave. It's too lucrative. Like it took my friend Fern a long time to like, because like Fern had burned out on the show even before I did, but was still like in the community because like, when she posted original songs, they just wouldn't get listened to, you know? Like, if it wasn't a poor song, no one gave a fuck. Oh, that's the whole thing. That community was, like, lucrative, but also insanely insular. Oh, yeah. Like, they don't... They literally don't care about anything else. Yeah. Like, I would try to make videos... When I, you know, first started making anime videos, I was still making Pony. And I did, like, probably ten anime videos, and they all had, like, barely any views compared to the Pony shit. Music videos, nothing, you know? Yeah, no. So they, uh, you, you gotta, you literally have to sell your soul. Like if yeah. you're still in Pony, I'm sorry that you've had to lose that part of your soul. Well, I mean, there are people you who know? still genuinely love it. Like I know some people who do. <laughs> sure, that's and, fair. And I mean, more power to you, I guess. Yeah. Like I have no, no, I can't mock you for it because I was there for like three years. So. Yeah, if you're still, I mean, if you like. I think it's was hilarious when Jesse and Hippo started up the horror 
the horsey hor- what the fuck was the horse cast? It was the pony did? cast. Pony cast. The pony cast was hilarious because they just kind of like, like, hey, we got a new thing and it's just a podcast and it's got a Patreon and they still made like a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars a month off of it or something. And yeah. I was like, how is this possible? Like back then, we we thought there was a minimum level of quality control that we had to do in order for anyone to care. Right, yeah. And it turns out we were wrong. At you least just in that, needed at least in to that talk community. about My Little yeah, Pony. It was... You know, I mean, not to knock that Jesse and Gibbon can do an entertainment no, 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 podcast no. deserving of money, but just the fact that, like, they couldn't have made that much talking about anything else. Yeah. You know? It was insane. It's funny, because there was, it was like, a couple months where I was talking with Matt DB again about starting, after I had, like, ended the last channel, and I was, like, wanted to make easy money, I was like, what if I just made a whole new channel and up-pitched my voice and just talked about the new season Dude, I've considered, oh, well, I wouldn't do it with ponies, but I've considered doing that plan, like, for other things, yeah. you know? Just, like, come back as a different guy. My my plan was like to up pitch my voice enough to make it sound like it was a woman to like double down on like getting more money. Oh boy, that's and then, fucked. And then I would have. And then you could do that. I could still could. Yeah, it'd have been it'd be very easy. But uh, no, I can't do it. Saner we, minds prevailed. The only reason I can't do stuff like that, I one time wanted to make a manga um, review channel that was going to be me with a pitch fo- with a pitch shifted voice. And the reason is, uh, back when I was doing anime blogging, I had gotten so known for, like, this particular style of, like, really abrasive and, like, incendiary dialogue that I wanted to, like, reset my identity and have people, like, because I had made, like, several other blogs, but I just wanted people to not know it was me and make, like, a polite character. So my manga blog was, like, very polite and serious and, like, no one knew it was me at all, but also it had very few readers. Right. But, like, I would See, the to funny do that thing on, is, on, if I had done this pony channel, the exact opposite would have happened. I have yeah. no doubt that if. Because the plan was was insidious and genius. Mm-hmm. It would have been girl, I'll pitch the voice. So, no one know me, girl, would yeah. have been very agreeable. And that's what everybody wants. Yeah. They want you to just suck the, dick sh- the show's dick. And then the piece de resistance would have been never can show my face because I was sexually abused and I don't want anyone to know who I am. Oh, so no. So, you would have just fucking crushed <laughs> on SJW money. <laughs> It would have been so good. Oh, if you ever got found... Oh, shit, the camera stopped. Hold on. No one can know my crime. (laughs) These are... Thankfully, when you have a microphone and it keeps cutting, it's real easy to sync back up. That's true. Um... Yeah, so, well, obviously, neither of us went through with those plans. In my case, I realized that the cadence of my voice is too recognizable. Like, if I read off of a script, I always read it the same way. And, like, no amount of voice morphing can make it, like, not obviously me. It's real yeah. sad. But you might have better odds because your cadence is not as recognized. Another thing I could have done is paid five dollars to some girl read it on Fiverr. That you could have done. Yeah. So, you know. But yeah. that would be a total evil scheme. And the best part is you could get away with it and just never tell anyone. Yeah. Like you don't even have to tell us. You could have actually done this. Yeah. Maybe I'm doing it right now. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Except that you wouldn't be quite as like you probably wouldn't be begging for money on Patreon. I just gotta keep, I just gotta keep the character going, it's fine. Yeah. So, all right, you were talking about M. Dot Strange. Yeah, you Huge actually influence. you actually worked with them before, right? Uh, I have worked with them a little bit, a couple times. Uh, the first thing I I mean I didn't really work with them on this, but like since ev- I was gl- glued to the production diaries on We Are the Strange, he was like, "All right, uh, I'm gonna need a bunch of extras. So mm-hmm. like, send me your photo, and I'll like fuck it up and like make you look like a psychopath, and you'll be in like a shot in this church scene." Mm-hmm. So I was like, "Okay." And I'm in the church scene at the in the middle of the movie. Okay. Yeah. That's neat. Can people cool. find you? Like, is if? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 like qu- it's a quick thing in the church scene, but it's more like it's also in the end credits, and it's pretty obvious. Okay. Um. So that that's I guess was so kind of the scour the end credits for Tom Oliver and We Are the Strange. Um. Before podcasting and like 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 uh, live streaming and stuff became a thing, he did live streaming on something called Blog Talk Radio. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I've heard the name, but I don't know what it was. What it was was that instead of like just talking live, um, you would you would do a live stream on the internet, but instead of like having people call Is that in your phone? Yeah, my phone's going off. Someone's trying to fucking call me. I'm trying to ignore it. Oh, it's another spam call. I made the mistake, I bought polystation2.com. And I didn't get the domain protection. So every day I get thousands of spam calls and like tons of what the fuck? things in my e- inbox saying, do you need web service? I'm like, bitch, 
I make websites. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> get out of here. But um, that's something I'm gonna ask you about in a bit. But yeah. yeah uh, so what was I even saying? Wasn't there something you worked on him with that had to do with mindless self indulgence? Yes, I did. I did all, uh, all the lip syncing for the characters in one of those mindless self indulgence videos he did because he did videos for mindless self indulgence and rabbit junk. What songs? Because I've never seen um, the only one I've ever seen is the Animal. Other. From that's from If, right? I think so. I don't even remember which fucking song that is. It's animal. It's animal. It's animal. Unbelievable. Okay, that sounds familiar. That might be from the. Oh, you know what? It's probably from the Three Heart album or the Heart. Maybe the Heart Shape one. I, I barely like, remember. Or less than. Three I did this during college, so when I should have been doing homework. That's probably the album that would have been coming out at the time, yeah. like two thousand ten ish. Two thousand. Eight two thousand nine ish probably. Okay, that's yeah. It's either from if or less than three. I think it's if, because less than three was like the short EP that came right after that, um, and I wouldn't recognize the songs as well on that. But <laughs> you know. in any case, uh, so how do you, do you think that like his style has influenced yours at all? Because yours doesn't really look like his. Your style is more like comic book. Influence. Yeah, I wouldn't say he influenced my style in terms of like his artwork. Like I, I think I'm more interested, as much as I love his movies, I'm much more interested in him as a person and his work ethic. Yeah. Um, Because I just, what I really liked about him back in the day and to this day is that he's like not afraid to like say things that are like fucking insane and, and like just like raw. Like he'll talk about like how much he hates like Hollywood and how much he hates like all this like shit because he just yeah. like is uncompromising and like because he could do like actual things that worked right. but he just doesn't give a fuck he's like he I, could be like a he could be working on like Coraline or something yeah but easily he'd rather make his like own. here's the thing like you don't he for somehow through like some like fucking I think it's just because it was unprecedented like he submitted We Are the Strange to the Sundance Film Festival mm -hmm. and got accepted. Right. So the movie showed there and he, he while he was there, like this is like him when he was still like not, didn't know much about Hollywood and everything, hated the entire experience because they like the, he got an agent from there and they're like, well, we need to buy out the theater. Uh -huh. So we need to like play, have all the theater when we play has to be full of, full of plants so everybody loves the movie. They react crazily over the top oh, so they boy. can like, get people to buy it. And he was like, get fucked. So instead, he just, like, went on Twitter and was like, hey, you want to come see the why movie? Would, why would they think a guy like that would be They didn't. That? They had no idea who they were dealing with. Like, did they watch the movie? Yeah. So what happened instead is that, like, they're just, like, normal people from the film festival came in. And then he had an army of people from Twitter who came in. Oh, yeah. Like, my, buddy, my buddy Ed went up there and, like, shit and went to see it. And, like, so everyone who was just there from the theater got up and left because they were disgusted by the movie. <laughs> everyone who poop brought there, like, fucking lost their shit. That's and great. so, but the, regardless, he got, like, I think, like, 10 or 15 deals on the movie and turned them all down. That's so, crazy. like, there was, like, big money on the table. And he was just, yeah. like, get fucked and just publish it himself instead. Didn't want it to go through any more bullshit. Yeah, because he was just, like, he looked through the contracts, like, okay, like, I don't own my movie anymore. Like, yeah. so fuck you. Yeah, no. You know, I and at this point, I'm sure he's probably made more on Blu-ray and DVD sales. You don't need to do that in today's world. Yeah, but know, this like, is like 2007, and he's like, you know, like had the foresight, just be like, fuck he's that. Ahead of the curve for sure. Yeah, he's like published like books, like. But that's the thing. I think that a lot of, uh, I think a lot of the, um, God, I'm about to sound real fucking old, and I'm accusing myself of this too. But I think a lot of our generation of like content creators are spoiled because we knew it was possible. Like a lot of the people before us were like hoping it was possible or like had the right. uh, like thought like hmm well you know you guys might not want to buy my movie but I see the internet over there and I'll bet if I release it there people might like it but like we know that we know it's possible exactly. and as a result I think that's why a lot more think, people now are like just doing like yeah. YouTube du jour instead of like their like, unique ideas the generation before us and you know it wasn't possible for them so I understand yeah. the, the the confusion but like the thing that really worked for MDOT for me is that he made me realize that I wanted to be my own boss. Because yeah. before that, like my plan was like, my, my, my big influence before that was uh, uh, Jonan Vasquez. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, I'll just like make a really cool comic and Very submit it to Very closely related, another yeah. MSI. Have you I, ever been into MSI or do you just happen to like I the just, artists I just happened, 
I mean, I've listened to a bit of Mindless Self Indulgence, but yeah. it's like it's good, but not like I'm a huge fan. Yeah, so like it's weird how like that it, the, yeah. it just worked like that because I watched his video he did for <laughs> them too. Yeah, and I was like, this is fucking dope, but it wasn't animated, and I was very yeah. disappointed because I wanted it to be. It's a fun video though, and super cool, but um. Yeah, like, so my plan before that was, like, I'm going to uh, publish with SLG or something like that. Because yeah. I was w- listening to a podcast called Indie Spinner Rack all throughout high school. And just these two guys who just, like, knew everything about the indie comic scene. Mm. And I ended up going to the Mocha Art Festival in New York and, like, met a bunch of people and, like, was, like, shopping shit Recommend around. Recommend me that podcast. Is it, like, is it good to get into if you don't know anything about indie comics? I knew nothing about indie comics going into it. They, they name drop a lot and don't provide a lot of context. Uh-huh. But they give you things to Google. Uh, right. the, the, the podcast is long defunct. Like, it ended, yeah. like, five years ago. But all the information on it is still pretty good. Yeah. And they recommend a lot. Like, like artists they recommend are, like, people, like, indie. Yeah, because they're, the artists... they're They're older, so it's, like, indie to them is, like, not, like, web comics. It's, yeah. like, they Xerox print yeah. books and, like, ship them out. The indie. hardest thing about uh, getting into, like, indie comics is just that nobody talks about them. Yeah, like, these guys did a really good job. And yeah. I just, like, started, like, learning, like, the names of the presses and, like, people. And I was, like, I bought a bunch of books. They did, like, a uh, – they did two anthologies, and I bought both of those. Mm-hmm. Um, and the guys, like, they did they did work and stuff. They went to, both went to the Joe Kubert School to, for comics. Yeah. And uh, I learned about um, where, the, where is that and what is that like famous? Uh, yeah, Joe Kubert's like a famous like comic artist, and like you go there and like you learn. Like, it's just you just go there to learn how to draw comics. And then there was another school that opened. Um, oh my God, was it the uh, Center for Cartoon Studies? And I learned about it through that podcast. And I was like, this is the college I'm going to. And oh I, boy! And I was so fucking stoked. And I was and because like this was like the tail end of high school. And my parents were like, you need to go to college. I'm like, eh, I don't want. I just want to draw. And they're like, no, do it. So I'm like, I want to go to the mo- go go. I want to go to CCS. And they're like, we are not signing loans for you to go throw your life away. Oh Little boy. did they know I was going to throw my life away regardless. Yeah. So what did you end up doing? Um, well, after that, I went to a bunch of art schools, like, quote-unquote, regular art schools. How old are you in, the, in this city? <sighs> 17. Okay. Uh, 17, 18-ish, at that, around that age. Like, it's just, you know, you got your birthday? November 8th. Okay. So. So you would have turned 18, like, towards the start of senior year. Yeah. So this I is, was, like, right before that. hmm So we're looking at colleges and stuff. And so everyone I go to, uh doesn't take me like i remember i went to uh the art institute of boston and the guy sat me down and was just like i'm sick and tired of seeing portfolios that are just shit get out was it shit yeah okay i was a really bad artist and i and i knew it have improved a lot yeah no i'm I'm definitely like way better than I. do you think you'd get accepted there now Probably not, just because like that. There, there. It was a fine art school. Like I never had a chance in hell of getting to a school like that. And that's yeah, kind of what I. Artist. Yeah, this is why I wanted Do you to go think to CCS. Into the CCS. Yes. Okay. Because they're 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 they would see your potential and think this is a totally right. different. Because your art style is real different. And I want to ask you about that too. Like, how the fuck did you develop this art style? Because I have literally never seen anyone with a style that even like resembles yours. Um, I don't. And yours has changed. A lot too, like because yeah. when you started doing um, My Little Pony art, you were doing very show accurate stuff, and mm-hmm. your stuff on its own was a little bit more. I don't know, like you, you're very into variable line widths. Yeah, which I don't think most people even know what the fuck that means. I only learned that term from you. Yeah, but it's where the I mean, it, it's as it sounds when you yeah. draw the outline of a character. It like has curves and like it gets thicker and thinner as yeah. it goes along. A lot of the, it's, it's very hard to do. Thick 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 line thicker lines are usually kind of used to uh, highlight shadows or like places yeah. that are supposed to be darker. Um, it's done a lot it I mean it's not done in animation basically ever because it's so hard to animate. Yeah. Because um, like if you're doing variable line width, you have to keep that line width placement consistent from yeah, frame to frame. It's a fucking which nightmare. like which, is, Which like, is why when people like watch like a, a One Punch Man Sakuga scene, they're like yeah, so it's fucking like, blown away, you know. So it's like how the fuck, like you're insane. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm super big into like line art and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, anime was the first big artistic influence for me. I was I mean, trying to draw anime, but I never could really do it. The only anime I can think of that has outlines as fucking thick with the two Cs as yours is DBZ. But, I mean, you were into that, right? Yeah. No, I was huge into DBZ. Or Powerpuff um, Girls. 
Yeah, uh, I did. I did like Powerpuff Girls a lot. I don't know. I just I just consumed a lot of different things. I watched like everything that was on Toonami. Um, I really liked the original Full Metal Alchemist when that was airing. I was obsessed with that. Uh, I don't think that comes through much in your art style. Maybe your writing, but not so much the. No, I don't think artistically it's a lot of influence like what, there. I mean, I'm, wasn't I there a comic artist who was like your favorite, who you used to list as like your biggest influence? Um, let's see. I. I I mean, one the guy, guy who worked in like all black and white. Aren't you like a fan of Bone? I do love Bone. Jeff Smith's Bone is fucking gorgeous. Because Bone is a little bit like your art. A little bit, yeah. It's it's way more detailed. That guy's like fucking super pro. Um, I like. Uh... Wait, am I thinking of? Is Bone the one that's like a detective? No. Uh, Wait, what is? Is it all black and white? It is. They did a reprint. Scholastic did a color okay. re- reprint That's of it, That's why I've though. seen a color version. Um, but, yeah, uh, I really like Dave Sim. He did Cerebus, which is another one that was like, mm-hmm. he did, oh, God, fucking Dave Sim. What a fucking winner. I just, I, my favorite artists are them, people who are just like, everything fucking sucks, do it anyway. Like, yeah. that just gets me, like, rock hard. It's so good. Like, Dave Sim's just like, like, Oh God, he's such a cool guy. So like he 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 did all this like three hundred issue comic by himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the tail end of it, he had some guy do the backgrounds with him. But he's just like an alcoholic guy who just draws comics and 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 just like says fuck you. Like like he he had this book that came out because he started in the seventies I think. And like he was quoted early in an early interview with Cerebus when someone asked him like how long is Cerebus going to be because it was like blowing up at the time. He's like three hundred issues, like mm-hmm. just kind of just not thinking. Yeah. And then he's like fuck, now I got to do three hundred <laughs> issues. So like he finished it in like two thousand five. So like thirty years oh, of just boy. grinding this shit out. And like I remember because they were talking about it on Indie Spinner Rack and they interviewed him. They were they, they one of their first gigs, their first like gags on the show was called uh, Dialing Dave because this is like when the internet still doesn't exist. So they would just look in phone books for people named Dave Sim, then call them live uh-huh. on the phone, and be like, "Are you Dave Sim who made Cerebus?" And like some random yeah. guy, be like, "Who the fuck is that?" And they'd be like, "Click." Yeah. Well, that's not Dave Sim. <laughs> so like there's like episodes of episodes of that, and they eventually like found the actual Dave Sim. I think like he contacted them or something but Dave Sim hates all technology doesn't own a computer doesn't have an email address or anything like that so he drew everything by hand and like cut out the zip tone dots and glued them down and like like fucking he cut wait (laughs) he so so you know like the half tone dots but you don't mean like individually no 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 he he did screen toning the screen toning I mean isn't that normal in Japanese manga though the Japanese are insane all right. Over here in America, where we where we take <laughs> where shortcuts, we have human rights. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we laugh, but it's not even that far from the truth. So, but so yeah, he he does this, and 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 they took. I guess at the end of Sarah, but they spoiled the end of Sarah for me because I still haven't finished it because it's like three hundred issues. So yeah. it's like he it's he his home. he he uh, published because he he had his own publishing company called Aardvark Verheim Press, mm-hmm. and he published everything himself. Because then this is the seventies, and like it's not right. internet, and even now he's like internet is gay. So he has he's some not wrong. No, he's he has <laughs> he has some guy run his website and everything. But um, so he had these big volumes that he called phone books because they were the size yeah. of phone books that had his comics in them. Um, and so at the end of the run. He kills Cerebus. Like, Cerebus dies at the end of everything. Well, now you spoiled Cerebus. Yeah, so, I mean, if I have to suffer with knowing how it ends, <laughs> all of you do too. I think, actually, because I'm on his emails, I think he started a new Cerebus series called... I mean, called... look, there's only two ways you can end a story. Right, Either the yeah. main character does or doesn't die. Like, those are the two endings. Yeah, so it's that's a pretty spoiler much. for you, then who the it's fuck cares? It's a coin cares? toss, you know? Yeah. Like... So, like, I think he actually is doing a new Cerebus series I need to look for, because I just got a message in my inbox, like, two days ago, called uh, Cerebus and Hell Issue 2 is out. I'm like, Whoa. what? So, but yeah. Whoa, the character has gone to hell. Is yeah. that, like, in the nature of the series to happen? Um, I mean... Or is that weird? I'm not super far into it, because I have the first three volumes, which is a fuck ton of comics by itself, but there's still, like, I think nine more that I have to get, and they're yeah. hard to track down. Oh, um, so, but yeah, at the so he dies and like they're they're talking to Dave Sim. They're like, I was really emotional. Like at the end of the series, like like did you feel like because you had been with this character for thirty years? Yeah. And he's like, How did you feel about like killing yeah. your character? And he's like, I'm so glad the fucker's dead. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just I like, imagine. like oh my god, that's all he's been looking forward to he, for thirty he, years. Getting like to kill halfway that through Cerebus's run, he came out with a book called the Cerebus Style Guide, uh-huh. and he was just like, look. You got to do a page a day. Uh-huh. You, and what you need to do is you need to, for a month, you have to do a page a day. And every day you don't fucking do it, you have to reflect on why 
You, you didn't, didn't get it do done. It. Oh, was it? Was boy. it? Be, well, he's like, was it because? Was it because you were lazy? You know, was it your girlfriend? You got to choose the page this is or the, the girlfriend. That's the power of uh, of comics is that because it's a well established medium that's been going for a hundred years. Like, there's generally like a speed people have agreed upon. Like, a page yeah. a day is healthy. More than that is necessary if you're doing a Shonen Jump comic. Yeah, you need to like. Week. But you need a team, probably. Oh I can't imagine. Um, I can't, like I as much as I like making art, I could never no, publish for no, Shonen Jump. No, 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 no. You well, you have to be real dedicated to both a doing manga and b making money. Yeah. Because like to make it in Shonen Jump, it's not about uh, doing the manga that you're the most passionate I about. Know, it's yeah. about doing the manga that is the I, best when idea. I, when I read Bakuman, you know? I like. Literally, like every every shonen anime I ever read dropped like two points across oh, the board because yeah. I realized <laughs> that they were all fake. I mean, I felt that way too, but at the same time, it made it more special when something is that good, and you're like, "Fuck, they did!" Like Bakuman makes Death Note more enjoyable because they talk about the serious comedy thing, and when you read about that, and then you read Death Note, and you see how they did that, and that the anime left it out, yeah, and you're just like, mm, "The manga was better." You know, like, this is why I read eight volumes of this and why I did not finish the show, even though I was interested, you know. But um, but in any case, so these uh, comic book authors are big influences on you yeah, mentality-wise. It sounds like you were – you did the same thing I did, which was brainwash yourself into believing that you can work from home and not have to answer to anybody. Well, the thing was is just fun. that I've never, ever, ever – ever been able to visualize myself in a professional environment yeah i just it's, dude it's fucking impossible well the thing is it's just like my biggest thing is i i know that i'm going to die yeah and the fact that like even like like that's i hate being depressed because i spend half my why, time doing something i don't want to do ever do anything you don't want to do if you might get hit by a car tomorrow right and you'll be like didn't do anything I wanted to do. Just and that's did and that's I why was told to do. When we did the the, the the art apologies thing, like that's why I hate that I haven't done any of this shit yet. So like yeah. my, my thing right now is I'm doing this polystation two thing and I'm like practicing my craft and getting better at doing like these fan art pieces. But like if nothing big happens with it, I'm just gonna like, fuck it. I'm just gonna do source or sloss. And like if I have to live in a box, so so be it. All right, heavy question. Would you say that that desire to like have completed things is what's keeping you alive? Yes. Because I got the sense that, like, because you've been, you've been openly very suicidal for a long time. Sure, yeah. Um, and, but it seems as though, like, the reason that you've never been, like, gung-ho about, I'm going to go die today, is that, like, you haven't made a masterpiece yet. I'm, like, I'm, like, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm depressed and anxious at the same time. And, yeah. it, and so it's just, like, I want, like, I definitely there are days I'm just, like, I'm just going to, like, end my life. Like, I feel like crap. Right. Scenario. You create something that you legitimately believe is, like, a work of merit. No one cares about it. What happens? Uh, nothing. Because I'm already operating under the assumption that that's what's going to happen. Like, my, deep down in my mind, I'm kind of convinced at this point, like, probably not going to be a digibro. Like, that's probably not going to happen for me. Like, becoming as big as I am? Because I don't intend to stay at this level. Right, but, like, no, I'm not even going to reach know. that point. I think I'm going to be this weird, awkward guy who's just going to not I don't know. It depends on... Further. Well, I think it depends on how legitimately good c the projects you come out with are. Because, like, so far, your narrative projects have never really come out. Yeah. No, it's, you know, it's or except fun. for the fi My Little Pony fan fiction. Yeah. But, like, you can't recommend that to your friends uh, too easily. No. <laughs> no, unfortunately. Well, <sighs> no, no. But, like, I, I just think that it's hard to say... Like, one of the problems I've always had with with uh, with trying to, you know, when you come to me for advice, I'm like, well, the problem is that it's hard to say if you need to, like, like, you're good enough that I'm like, clearly this guy could do, like, an amazing series, like, a great, he could write a great novel, he could write a great comic, he could write a great whatever, but, like, it hasn't happened yet. Right. And so it's hard for me to say, like, oh, you're, you know, people just don't care about your art style. As opposed to, well, if you gave them, like, a great story, they they might. And maybe the kinds of stories that you are best at telling can't be done in a short amount of time, you know? Like, because there are some people who can just, like, draw a picture in, a, in an hour and it somehow tells a story and people are, like, 
entranced by it. And then there's other people who are like, I can tell a way better story than that, but you're going to have to give me a year. Right. Well, that's my <laughs> – I just – I work insanely slowly. And yeah. I don't know – I don't know if it's because I just have a really shit work ethic or if I'm just like <laughs> – I think it's your I, – I, I'm going to go ahead and say I don't think that your work ethic is your biggest problem because I think that the work I've seen you do – is unbelievably taxing the way you do it. Like back when you used to draw, because you did a few art live streams when you were doing the Trixie comic. Um, do you want to explain that period of time? How what yeah. happened there? Um, well, Actually, we might have to cut off and upload footage and then read restart if this is going to be long. Because it's only like six minutes left of recording. I could probably get through this in six minutes. All right. Um, no, well, that was just I, I got I got big into vectoring. Mm-hmm during MLP because that's like how they did the show was with right. vector graphics. Um, the difference between doing vector graphics in the show versus when I was doing them because like a vector graphic is just it's infinitely scalable. Yeah. So like it's all done with points and math instead of pixels. Um, but the way you do vector, vector art like precisely is you use the pen tool. Right. And so you base it's all done with Bezier curves. So do you curves. not do that anymore when you draw? Uh, no. I've okay. moved. I've moved. I mean, sometimes Thank I still God. do. Because when you were doing that, I watched some of those live streams and you would be like drawing a tree for three hours. Yeah. And I was like, this is why, like you could, you were doing commissions that you literally could charge somebody like $50 and it you're you're only getting paid like a dollar an hour for the amount of right. work you did. I'm running into that problem right now with 3D because like I'm doing I'm pricing it out like if I want to start commissions. Are you doing commissions or are you just uh, planning I'm it? Planning on it, but the problem is like to to charge minimum wage to do a commission, it would start at like $300. And, and no how one, long is the commission? Or just is it just a model or It's just like a model. To do yeah. a model with like a turnaround in one pose would take probably like There's some people who would buy it, but they're not in your no. YouTube audience. No, they're not know. like they're they're no I don't know them yet, yeah. <laughs> essentially. Alright, the card is filled up, so we'll take a short break to uh unfill it. There we go. So before we just took a little break, you were talking about your influences and how you have a lot of clear influences on like your lifestyle and mentality but not so much on your actual aesthetic art style yeah i, I guess it's kind of that's a bit more nebulous to track um my, my art style has changed a lot uh as as time has gone by uh, I, can, I can definitely recall like specific artists that i was trying to integrate into my style but my my, my art really took off when i stopped trying to, to actively that, develop yeah. it um, Joan and Vasquez was huge back in the day. I think everybody had a Joan and Vasquez phase who was into drawing comics or art in the mid 2000s. Like Invader Zim killed all of us. Yeah. And then Johnny the Homicide and Maniac and Squee and all that shit. Um, <coughs> I remember distinctly, uh, I started getting into Spawn, like the, o the original like Spawn run mm -hmm. from Image and, uh, Oh God! What's the guy's name? Not Todd McFarlane. Uh, I like, I love his art too. But like the guy specifically, uh, Steve. No. F mm. Oh God, I'm blanking. But it was, it was a specific, specific artist artist on Spawn that I really fucking liked. Um, Dave Capullo. He was fucking dope. And like his art's the complete antithesis of what I do because it was like really thin lines, tons of cross hatching, and extraneous detail everywhere, and like really yeah. soft painterly colors. It was like he took like Todd's art style and like pushed it further, um, and I but I really liked him. There was a whole phase during college where I was desperately trying to do that mm -hmm. and failing miserably because I have no patience. And at one point specifically, I remember in illustration class, I was like, "Fuck it, I'm not this." So I did the exact opposite and did really simple, cartoony things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably where my style like kind of became its own because I realized like I'm way too lazy to sit there and spend right. 10 hours on one Is there any way that people can look at like your old fucking like super detailed shit? <sighs> is any of that online? I mean, I don't think any of it's online anymore. Uh, was it, it any good? No. Or, okay. That was the whole pro problem is like I didn't have the patience to d be a Dave Capullo because right. like his art, like you could you zoom in. You have to in. plan that shit. Like extensively to make it work. It's just right? like I don't I don't know how how people sit there because like my whole thing is like I want to tell the story. Yeah. And the art. Well, you've always been way more of a narrativist than an aest aest aesthetician. Sure. I suppose, which is kind of funny because you do mostly work in visual mediums, or you've you've I. I, like, you've I, always considered, like, visual mediums to be at the forefront of your career, except for the period where you were trying to be a novelist. Yeah. Um, 
how do you like reconcile that? Sure, I think th- I really enjoy my my favorite things. Like ever since I was a little kid, like stories and like yeah. experiencing stories have been really thing. I think one of the my very 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 first influences was Animorphs. That yeah. Scholastic book series, like everybody laughs at them for the covers. That book series was fucking crazy. Like people were killed. You just reread that a couple years ago. I did. I, I, read, I, bought, I bought the whole series again to read, check it out. And like the writing is super basic, but like it's about like ki- high school kids being traumatized by war. Like that's what the entire thing's about. And like the book ends super solemnly. There's no happy ending. They don't win. Shit's bad. Oh. That's fun. Like, like they, they end up like, like spoilers for Animorphs. So I'll, I'll actually warn you this time. They end up like repelling the, the aliens and everything. But the book, the last book is like 15 years later. Uh, one of the characters has post traumatic stress disorder. And nobody knows where he is. He just dropped off face of the planet. Uh, the, 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 the like ship that was through the entire book, Cassie and Jake, never happens. They break up because Jake is like not able to like parse, like not yeah. being in war. So they can't work out. Uh, and like it's just like super like just like how like Fuck. soldiers they never recover yeah and so like the book ends with like Jake like going back into space to go on another mission and like yeah. the, the book ends with them encountering some other aliens and like it's like do they live or die we don't know that's some heavy shit yeah like like the, the thing is like they like get stabbed and murdered and like severed and like like there's one point where like uh like one of them gets cut in half and they have to like demorph back to human because when you re- you your wounds recover when you go back to a, your regular yeah. form so like they almost die a bunch of times there's like torture and murder and like all this crazy shit That's like nuts. there's this, I never actually read any of those it's so books. good oh god I really wish there was like a, a like an adult revision of this because the way it works is that um there's these aliens called the Yurks, and like they're parasites. So they go into your ear, mm-hmm. and they take they wrap around your brain and take over your body. Right. And so there there's like these aliens everywhere. Um, like parasites. They're parasitic aliens, and uh, they have like these. They've taken over tons and tons of worlds. Now they're coming to Earth because in this world, Earth is like we're basically we breed like cattle. So like there's like we're billions of people on Earth. That like doesn't happen. Like all these yeah. other planets, there's a couple million of, of oh, yeah, most yeah. species but here it's like a gold mine for this alien race i'm like we're super underdeveloped That's but our really bodies are like really great for them so they're like trying to take over the planet and then there's other aliens called the andalites who are fighting them and so um the way they fight them they have this to basically for espionage is morphing so you can like acquire the dna of an animal by touching it and then for two hours you can transform and become them mm-hmm. um but if you don't demorph in two hours, you're trapped in that form forever. So the characters don't have, like, a specific animal they morph into. They just can morph into yeah. animals. You can okay. pull a bunch of different ones. And once so you acquire like a DNA. Beast boy power. Kind of essentially, thing. yeah. But the interesting thing is when you transform into an animal the first time, you have to fight its instincts because it can take over your mind and you just oh, become. Shit. So you, that ever happened to any characters? It does. It does temporarily. Like, the, one of the scariest things is, like, when they, tra- they have to morph into ants. And, like, oh, ants are just, like, automata. Right. So for, like, 15 pages, they're just, like, they, they, they find another ant colony. And, like, they're, they're describing what happens, but they have no control of themselves. They're, like, biting other ants in yeah. half and having this huge colony war. And, like, halfway through it, they realize what's going on. And, like, they demorph in the middle. Like, they burst yeah. through a wall and, like, fall out. And cool. it's, like, they're all traumatized. And, like, like, 20, 30 books later, they're, like, let's never morph into ants again, ever. No, no, no. But one of the kids, Tobias, like, he, the very first book, he gets stu- trapped in the form of a hawk. So for like half the series, he's just a hawk. Whoa! And so he lives. He lives in the woods. He and like he for the first for the first like twenty or thirty books, like people are like he'll, he'll like go to like Jake's house and like he'll like feed him like a hamburger or something because he has to yeah. just eat meat now because he's a bird. Um, and uh, eventually, uh, he just like he's been in a hawk so long, like he just succumbs to the the. Uh, the instinct and he starts hunting and like killing like they describe in great detail he finds a mouse rips it open it starts yeah. feasting on its intestines and he has like a fucking panic attack but eventually like his like subplot is like learning to just accept the fact that like this is who so he, he is like, now so he like narrates through this yeah this hawk and every every book changes narration it's first person narration but every single book it changes from one of the ma- five one okay. of the six main characters so this is one of his books where he just describes it like yeah I just ate this thing and it was fucking great. <laughs> so like he just starts doing that and like at the end in the last book in the series they're like because he, he never he's just a hawk so like they're just yeah. like we don't know what happened to Tobias like hawks only live for a few years he could be dead we don't know he just disappeared. 
That's nuts. It's 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 so fucking good. But like that's like <laughs> That and Digimon are probably, like, my two big, like, super big influences in the beginning. Because those are, like, the only things that had, like, a continuous narrative that yeah. kept going on. Um, so, all right. Well, I guess we kind of got to the heart of your uh, your influences. Unless there's any yeah. other, like, are there any influences that aren't really, like, art-related but are, like, way more than most people realize, like, affect your life? Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, like... I, I watched a lot of like like YouTube like uh, I really like Gary V. He's fucking dope. Never heard of him. Uh, he does like uh, business and like social media and personal brand development and stuff. Mm. He's super cool. I'm about to read his new book. What would you say out. your biggest influences as a YouTuber? Holy shit! I don't know. I really yeah. don't. I mean, it's just kind of an amalgam of like. Yeah, it's just like I don't styles that have sort of sprung from the primordial I mean, ooze of YouTube. The biggest one that we both had in the beginning was uh, Sequelitis. Like, that's where yeah. our whole format initially came from. Pretty much. Was just, like, trying to... I mean, to he take... took it from Mr. Plinkett, so, yeah, it so really, he's, like, the forefather of this current style, you know? Yeah. But, um, uh, in terms of, like, I really liked just, like, tech YouTubers when I was doing Rebel Pixels. So a lot of MKBHD and, yeah. and, like, Austin Evans and, and, and like, Pocket Now and a bunch of all the, all the big ones. You definitely had MKBHD's like uh, attitude towards tech, which is like these sh- everything should be like kind of sleek and modern. And like, I mean, it's unfortunate that you were filming it in a basement as compared to his fucking studio. Yeah. I mean, not that he always had that, but like, you know, you have you you branded it very strongly to look like that kind of channel. Like everything is like modern and cool and. Yeah, I mean, that's what I went to school tech, for, so... Yeah. yeah, tell me more about that, because, again, um, a lot of the things about you that fascinate me the most are the things that have nothing to do with YouTube at all, um, such as your graphic design and website design yeah. history. Because you make good... We- How the fuck did you make the Sorcerer's Lost website, the motion comic site? A like, lot of work. It was just, like, all... I mean, I still have the file. You can look at it. It's all hand-coded, just, like... Those aren't, like, GIFs or... No, they're uh, or anything. They they were video files with no audio, and then you there was an HTML five. They have like a video embed like uh, yeah. I don't even remember what the word before it is at this point. Just like a option you can do. In case anyone doesn't know what we're talking about, go to the Sorceress Lost site. Yeah, it's still up. Unfortunately, some of the fonts don't work anymore because like Dropbox. I was hosting a bunch of stuff for it on Dropbox, um, and then Dropbox changed the way their file system works, so you can't link out to other files anymore so all the web fonts and stuff I was hosting all don't work so it's like in Times New Roman it looks 10 times worse than it used to um, but yeah it's just uh, and then I went into the player you can edit the properties of the player so I set it to autoplay and then to hide the controls so they look like GIFs they act like GIFs but they're video files so like a tenth of the size of a yeah. GIF that would be but you can scroll over it and like yeah when you scroll the over track. it the controllers the pop, they pop up right it's really sleek looking and I'd never seen anything presented that way but i assume that the bottom line is it is not worth the amount of effort to tell that story that way um i mean now that i can do 3d it would be so much easier to do the same thing do you still think you might take that direction with the it's very sorcerous loss i really to go back to the question that you initially asked was uh, how do i reconcile yeah wanting to do visuals but being a very narrative centric person the reason i started writing for a while is because like i came to the conclusion like all i really care about is telling the story yeah and like why not just do that and the problem not even the problem but like what i realized through doing that is that i really like visual storytelling i like being able to like move the camera around and like a big part of without just i hate description yeah like every time i gotta get to a book and like when they have to describe all this shit like like the Scootaloo bo- book that I wrote, it doesn't have the word said in there ever. I yeah. ne- made sh- an act of decision to never have a said tag because I hate that so fucking much. The word said. Yeah, so every time, instead of like saying like, they said, I'd be uh, like. You know that the opposite is what is preached is correct and right. Right, right. Well, the yeah. thing is, I, I, the, it's because they say don't change said to like, he replied right. or he did. So what I did instead is I would use what's called an action tag. So uh-huh. instead of being like saying like, like, hey, Digi, I said uh-huh. or something, I'd be like, I picked up the can off the table. Hey, Digi. And then, yeah, you know, I love stuff like that. So it was 
I don't put any sets in my stories usually either, but I'll just like full paragraph break for dialogue. Yeah, I mean, write it like a script, you know. The thing I, that's how I usually start when I would write all those chapters, like because the dialogue is the part I love doing the most. I just write the dialogue out and then be like, okay, I guess what, what are they gonna do while they're talking? And then I just yeah. go back through and like slowly piece a scene together. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. But that, but doing all that, like I loved writing the dialogue. I loved right. coming it up with this story conceptually, but I would get super bogged down and like trying to not a um, writing like descriptions of things yeah. because like I'm like I could just draw this and then B like transitioning from scene to scene was also tricky I don't I don't know how to like I don't know if it's just that back in the old times when you had to read books I think people had a just more uh, ability to imagine what those places looked like because when I read like a long descriptive part of a book I cannot picture it at all like, I just come up with whatever I think it might, but I'm just like, this doesn't feel right. The yeah. same way that just seeing a picture, you in, a picture, whoever said a picture is worth a thousand words underestimated the worth of a picture. Right, Like, yeah. a thousand no. words ain't that much, and you can tell a fucking big story with a picture. Like, yeah. just show a picture of someone's room, and you can tell me, like, a thousand things about that For character, sure. you know? So... I totally agree that, like, with certain scopes of stories, like, a big fantasy story, like, it's real hard to be able to, like, write yeah. enough minute details without it bogging down. Like, a lot of fantasy novels it's, and shit. I have a great example know, of this in we'll Sorcerer's so Lost. so in-depth. Of, of why, like, this is actually one scene in the beginning of SL that I don't think I'm going to use anymore, but at the time in the first revision I was working on really made me like think oh, fuck i don't really think i can work with books the way i want to because yeah. there's there's a shot that i had that uh in the beginning of the story sarah was going to go to like uh the docks and meet somebody who was coming in for her, her mentor and yeah. pick up these scrolls that, she, that the, he needed so i what i wanted to do she was going to sit down on like a bench wait for the ship to come in and then they're like make a sound like the ship's coming into dock yeah. she'd turn around and like it would, the camera would zoom out, and you see that not only is the ship coming to dock, the island's like floating in the sky, being suspended yeah. by magic. So there's like this airship coming into dock, oh, not so just a regular ship. So it zooms out, oh, you have this big glory clever. shot. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. But then I switched to a book. I'm like, how the fuck am I going to do this scene? Yeah. There's no way to give the camera pans right. out, and like it would sound. So like, but that's how you I have think. The mind of a visual artist. So I'm yeah. like, I can't write it. Like it's exactly. A, I can write the dialogue just fine, but it, like in terms of like telling this story and just telling stories in general, I'm thinking like a director and not yeah. an when, author. When I was trying to write the 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 book that I wrote back in 2010 for Nano Remo, like. It took me two years to get it to the stage of a novel because the initial idea I had was just of, like, a scene of someone firing a bullet and then, like, time stopping and the character, like, flicking it around and shooting it back or something like that. But the only way it made sense in my head was visually. It's right. like no one will understand how cool this power looks if I describe it in text because you don't see the bullet stop. Right. You know, so it won't – this story can't be told that way. Yeah. Eventually, I just changed the story until so, it worked for me. Yeah, I, I cut that scene out of the, the, the written version. It's up on Tumblr. You can read it. It doesn't happen like right. that. But, like, I don't... I, I don't... <laughs> I mean, every time someone makes a YouTube video about any adaptation of anything, they're like, oh, mediums can't be crossed. Like, it's new information. But, like, you do kind of have to keep reminding people, including yourself, like, hey... Some of your ideas just won't be yeah. doable. I mean, to, 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 in defense of books, something that's really easy to do with books that's harder to do with other visuals exposition. is engage. Even Not even exposition thing. I was going to say is engage all the senses. Yeah. You can describe easily how things smell, how they yeah. feel, that's without true. having to like – like, if you're going to do that in a visual thing, like, you can either imply it with visuals or you're going to be like, hey, it stinks in here, you know? Yeah. The, you, you can't really, like, elegantly integrate Im senses I like think you can the, in a book. I think the best thing about uh, text is just that, like, a character can easily give their reactions to a situation. Yeah. And I think that, like, a lot of the reason that adaptations from, like, books to film always end up so bad is that, like, the book... It, the book is not focused on the visual element because it can't do that well. Right. It's focused on the fucking thoughts in the character's head. So, like, most books are more focused on character development. Well, I think, I know, you know, and, like... Something that I was noticing while I was writing, because I was trying to figure this out myself, is that, like, f any visual medium kind of always, like, has the issue of time. Yeah. Right? Because, like, most of, most of a movie is done basically, like, each scene is in real time, whereas yeah. in a book... 
like in between two people talking, like one sentence and another, mm -hmm. the character can have a thought that goes on for like 16 Seven pages. pages. Yeah, exactly. And like, <laughs> there's no way to, you can't just like stop the frame, like whoop, and then the character thinks. Right. Like it feels totally weird. And what are you gonna show? Right, you can't really like, do anything. Like you, like, yeah. like you'd have to like go into their head and like animate all this stuff, but like it, right. it feels awkward because like nothing's shot like that. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, there's lots of books that like, like House of Leaves. There's no way to make not a book because like it's constant notations and active reader participation. You can maybe make it a visual novel, but not yeah. a, not a book, you know. But um, yeah. So so Sorceress Lost is still in the works. Would you say for sure? Okay. Um, I just finished like a rewrite a, like a month or change ago. I have the first chapter redone. So how, like, glued to this universe are you, A Sorceress Lost? I like, really enjoy it, and depending on how... I mean, my plan initially was, like, I would want to have, like, any future stories I do take place in Salion as well, which is, like, the name of the world. Yeah. I, uh... Speaking as one former aspiring author who gave up on his world to another... Um, cause for me, the hardest thing about any project is I have an idea for the next project. And so like it becomes, I don't want to let this project take up too much of my time because I want to move on to the next one. Do you ever feel that way about Sorceress Lost? Like, is there another project like underneath that waiting to get out? Or is it more like this is my thing and I want it to fucking happen? Uh, the weird thing for me, and like this almost undermines everything I've been saying so far is that. I and like this is something I'm I've been dealing with a lot recently and trying to figure out and I think I've kind of understood it is that because I have like all these self-esteem problems mm -hmm. like w my projects don't feel real or as special like I can't be as passionate about SL yeah. as like how I got I can't be as into SL as I was into like MLP or something like that just because mm -hmm. like because it's from me it feels tainted almost yeah like in intrinsically but like the way I'm trying to like get around that is I I've, I've I've found that some of my best work and the things I can get most hype about that I work on is when I'm working as a group because then the project yeah. transcends just me and it becomes bigger and more important. Did you watch my Dear Artists video? I did. Because I, you inspired that video. I figured when I was like the first photo to come up as like artists struggling, I was I like... Think <laughs> it, I think I was watching... Did you recent like in the last week put out like a hyperbolic wine chamber or something? Yes. Because it was I was watching that and you were just talking about like the difficulties of marketing yourself and stuff and I just somehow the thought crossed my mind about Vocaloid or something and I was just like Tom should do that or something I don't, I don't know I was just like artists can team up and they can make it like take some of the burden off of yourself yeah. you know it doesn't have to be all you most. I think that the YouTube sphere is very individualistic, even though there's, like, tons of YouTube channels that are teams, you know? Like, right. especially a lot of the big ones have multiple persons behind them. But, like, I think the romantic idea of the YouTuber is, like, guys like Casey Neistat who are just like, I don't sleep and I make a video every day and it's always good. And so we pressure ourselves to be like that. Um, and obviously, you know, the idea of, like, auteur artists and shit. But, like... Even if fucking, you could look at Quentin Tarantino and be like, oh, he's my favorite director. But it's like, he would be nothing without the cinematographers right. who bring those fucking shots to life. Because sure. his cinematographers are god tier. So, like, you know, I think not enough people, because some, some people responded to my video like, isn't this all obvious? This is 101 shit. And other people were like, thanks, Digi, revolutionized my life. Gonna implement this right now. <laughs> yeah, and, I was looking through the comments. Because, like, I, yeah. I was kind of like, in both camps, because it's like, yeah, this is like something I've been considering, and at the yeah. same time, other people were like, eh, I don't know. So I guess it depends on where you are. Yeah, I mean, but, for um, some people, they just never even think about how, like, marketing yourself is extremely difficult, because first of all, you have to recognize what about yourself is marketable, and then you've got to figure out, like, who is going to care, right. and how do I find those people and show it to them? Well, I think one of know? the things that, like, I've had issues with is that, like, I've always been afraid that the stuff I actually want to do has no market value. Right. Because like even That's with PolyStation Two right have, now, I think like it's I'm doing fan art on PolyStation Two when like at my core, like if you ask me what do I think of fan art, I think it's stupid. I think it's a waste of time. Yeah. Like it's not like it's obviously a great marketing tactic to right. use, but I don't feel like I feel like it has inherently less artistic value 
than doing original work. But ironically, it is the only thing anybody cares about. Exactly. Unless, unless, well, okay. At the same time, though, I do feel like there's a little bit of anytime. Well, okay, you're gonna agree with me on this because you're really hard on yourself. You would probably say that if you made a good enough story, you would need to rely on fan art. Um, I mean, some people do that. I mean, yeah. I, I think if you get to a certain, there's a certain like level that once you hit that, like yeah. the work speaks for itself. Right. I mean, Most people like, aren't there. Everything that people are drawing fan art of is something that reached that level. Exactly. You know, like it had to be good so, enough that people it inspired fan art, and you know, um, it was. I got a really interesting comment on that wine chamber I did. Someone said like, uh, "It's like I've never really personally connected to your work." Because the most of the stuff you've been doing recently is fan art, whereas I really connect to Ben because everything he's doing is his own work. Right. I'm like, that's an interesting. I mean, thing. for me, the difficulties with connecting with your work is mostly that I know how much you hate it, and it's hard for me, like especially the YouTube videos. Yeah, I just I'm not like if I watch a YouTube video that I know you didn't want to make, then I'm just like, well. He obviously, like, sometimes you just seem like you're having fun with it. Like, you put out a vlog because you just wanted to rant about this thing. And, like, that's why a lot of my videos exist. They, they weren't made for an audience. They were made because yeah. I had an idea and I thought, eh, 3,000 people will click on this. It's worth posting, you know? <laughs> like, someone might think this is quotable or funny or they've had the same thought. But, uh, but when it's one that I can see that you, like, forced yourself to do, I'm just like, Tom, you got to get out of there. Like, yeah. you got to get out of there. You got to make the stuff you want to do, you know? Yeah, and that's, like, I mean, the, the next couple months, like, I have my nest egg for moving, which is going to happen, I guess, in a few months. So I quit my job before coming to RadCon because I'm, like, yeah. I'm just going to focus on getting that Tell us about the job you've been doing. I want people to understand oh, the – because you've talked about it briefly – but the conditions of this job are terrible. And it's because yeah. I guess the guy who hires you owns half the city. Yeah. And can just do whatever he wants. Yeah. Because um, we, we actually, uh, when it got really bad, we actually talked to one of the, uh, like, officials for the town. And he was like, yeah, it's fine. But you can't do anything about it. Like, don't try. <laughs> so I'm just like, okay. Uh, but, yeah, no, I work – for the last, like, two years, I've worked as a uh, quote-unquote security guard at an abandoned building, uh, Draper Mill, in the center of our tiny little town. And it's an old old building. It's, like, stripped to the bone. There's just nothing in there but, like, asbestos probably and lead, mm -hmm. even though apparently they've done, you know, inspections and it's fine, maybe. But, uh, yeah, and I just – I do the graveyard shift, so 11 p.m. to 7 in the morning – and you just wander around an abandoned just building. Just wander around the abandoned building just and to, do your rounds. Just to what? Make sure homeless people don't sleep there? I mean, or? we don't even have homeless people in Hopedale. But, what, uh, what did anything ever happen that would there were the warrant only thing, you having been there? Okay, well, the reason that I'm tech, they call you a security guard. The reason I'm there is I'm babysitting the building because the, we go around the entire building and like make sure the fire extinguishers are fine uh -huh. because there's the building isn't up to fire code. And okay. so legally, this guy has to have someone in there to use the fire extinguishers in case the building catches on fire. But we're neighbors with the head of the fire department. And he said, if you want to die, do your job. If you want to live, get the fuck out of that building if it ever catches on fire. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so you've been doing this incredible, dangerous, dirty job. Does it pay over the table? Yeah. Okay. So... But it's just a shit job that you that it's the guy cannot bad. be taken to task for. And yeah, and he just owns. You were like doing a bunch that for property. like over a year, right? Yeah, like two years. Holy shit! Yeah. But you kindly quit. Yeah, I figured, whatever. I'm I mean, not gonna have a house in a month anyway. Yeah, so. fuck it. So okay, I need to understand exactly the plan because I kind of like the idea that you're just gonna try to live in your car and do art from there. Yeah. Uh, what do you, what is the plan? Like, well, where the, are you taking the car first? Well, here's the thing. The thing is I have a couple options, apparently. I have uh, a friend who might wanna move in with me, but she's been very slow on the uptake on that. Mm. So I'm not really relying on that. Uh, but if I did that, I'd have to like be a normal person and get another real job. And like, I don't really right. technically want to do that. So that's, like, one of the options. The second option would be to buy a tiny house. Are they cheap that cheap? Uh, they can be. 
Okay. Some of them are because usually like a, a tiny house can be just is like a tiny house cheaper than a trailer. Uh, you can just get a trailer. A trailer. If you're gonna put yourself down. Um. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking into options right now. Uh, trailer is definitely one option. Tiny house is. I mean, a lot of tiny houses are just like houses <coughs> built on a trailer bed anyway, so they're around yeah. the same size, but just a bit nicer. Okay. Uh, and then the other option is to convert a cargo van into a mini like apartment on wheels and drive are around. you aware of the youtuber noah caldwell gervais have no, i told you about him you've not okay so this guy is a gaming youtuber whose thing is that he does like two and a half hour long analysis videos of entire franchises like he'll he'll do like dragon's age and then he'll go through all the dragon's age games and talk about all the storylines and compare everything and say like here's what was good here's what was bad and uh, his audio is dog shit. He doesn't edit the audio at all, so you can hear him like rustling with papers and fucking up lines and um, fucking stuttering. He's got a very dry voice. He barely edits the video. It's usually just like long gameplay footage. But just because of the fact that he talks about an entire game series all the way and talks about everything, and because of the fact that it's all PC games that have like fervent cult followings, He's got a huge Patreon, uh, not not huge like mine, but like, you know, big enough to sustain himself on. And he had been uh, a pizza boy at the time, but he had this. He's like a huge into road novels, like obsessed with road novels. So he like refurbished a Volkswagen van for like three years, and now him and his wife like live out of the van and just travel the country. Do like he just uploads YouTube videos from wherever, yeah, and like subsists off of Patreon and like. Sort of him doing that was part of what inspired me to hit the road, you know, and be like, oh, shit, we can do this from anywhere. I got it fucking the camera. Just stop. When you told me you were going to be doing <laughs> PS2 graphics out of the back of a car, I was like, hey, it's Noah Caldwell Gervais yeah. doing I mean, it. I there's, mean, there's a whole, You're like... You're making as much as he is. There's but. a whole, uh, like, culture of people doing that. Like, mm -hmm. I follow tons of YouTubers right now who are... Just all, traveling. Just and traveling and doing that. Like, the difference is I that mean, they do it because, like, they love living on the road. Usually I'm doing they have it because a house, I hate having a life. Usually they have a house to go back to, though. Noah Caldwell Gervais was just dirt poor, Although and he, like, just sold off the house and all of their belongings and went into the Volkswagen van. Like, yeah, I mean, that is the life now. There, there are people who do that. They just, like, they live the van life. Like, they've just decided to... I could live the RV life. I could not live the van life, the, like, Volkswagen van, where the, the bed is, like, your body width from the ceiling, yeah. you know? It's pretty – it's it's cramped as fuck, dude. But, I mean, I don't feel like I would be that much – You don't take up much space. <laughs> except as of being, like, six foot three. Yeah, but, like, in terms of, uh, you know, your 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 range of activity. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I would only sleep in the thing. Yeah, I I would plan plan on probably just like going to like coffee shops or whatever and hanging get, out in net cafes. Yeah, and just, just I mean I can do my work there. Yeah. So, but like a tiny house would be kind of the same <laughs> idea. Um, I just I don't like it said like I can't even imagine like getting up at like six a.m. putting on like dress clothes, going into a cubicle. No. Like I would either like get a gun and either kill myself <laughs> or everyone the around me. The second you walked through the door. Because, I, I mean, I've done that. I, I did a, an internship for my dad at, at, at Hanscom Air Force Base for, like, a summer and a winter. And it paid good money. Yeah, I want to be clear. You, like, you are, like, uh, first of all, how old are you? 29. So you're 29. I yeah. think you're the, is you or Ben the oldest? Ben is the oldest by a couple months. Okay, so you're sort of a battle-hardened veteran of many life trials. Uh I guess. I don't feel like... I feel like my life's been pretty easy, which is weird. I mean, compared to... Let me put it a different I was telling way. Munchie about how I got fucked over on my job, and he was, like, flabbergasted, but I'm just like, eh, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's that you have... You've been to enough things that I wouldn't say that, like, you're... When you're saying, I can't even imagine myself at a normal job, it's like, you, you've worked them. You're not just saying that. Yeah. Because, like, I know there's a lot of people... Like, I like to say things like, oh, like, I could never go back to work. But, like, I didn't even really hate the one job I've ever had. And, like, so I could probably do a normal job. Like, I probably could. Not for long, because I'd be constantly scheming to quit. But, like, um, you know, you are not just saying this out of nowhere. You've worked a bunch of places. I yeah. know you worked at a Whole Foods. I did. That was probably my longest stint. Yeah. Was so I did, like, I, I, it was... I have, like, this curse, like, except for this job, which was, like, 
To make it clear, I was so bad even at this job that I probably should have been fired, but there was nobody else there to fire me, so it was yeah. impossible. And nobody else would do that shift. So yeah. like, I, I when I put in my notice like a day before I came here, the guy was like, "Are you sure? We can give you like two months off to like not be sick and dying anymore." <laughs> and I'm just like, "Nah, oh, dude, wow. I'm cool." They were just gonna offer you months off. Yeah, they're just like, like, "We can give you two months off if you need to like recover," and I'm just like. I'm okay. Because <laughs> they know how bad it is. Right, because they, they know they know winter. that no one's going to oh, take that slot. Oh, you should have quit before the winter even started. But, oh, but the well, winter was bad. You get to enjoy the summer. Okay, to, just to tell you how bad it was, um, I can actually show you a photo after this to show you what the office ended up looking like if you want to laugh your ass off. Uh, I kept it for legal reasons because I figured if shit was going to go down, I needed ammo. Yeah. But um, If anybody f- decides to class action this guy, you can jump so, in on that shit. So, I think that's how that works. The... Uh, the building for almost the entirety of the summer had no, uh, for the entire winter had no heat anymore. The heat was broken. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I hadn't even imagined that heat would be involved. Yeah. So like there you was. You showed me pictures of this place. There's not even like walls. There's like the one little there. office where they kind of had heat, but the heat stopped working. Yeah. So it was just like, and then the whole building leaks. So every time it rains, the office floods, the entire building floods, but like the building never completely dries. So there's mold oh, and mildew no. all through the whole place. Why is it keeping it up? Because they can't get rid of it. The problem is, like, the town's water supply runs under this building. Ugh. So if they do anything to it, the entire water supply is fucked. Oh, boy. And, and so they're just stuck with the shitty building. Yeah, there's no nothing. It's it's just a relic of a lost age that can't be salvaged and can't be destroyed. To, to, and this guy has to pay I, somebody to do this job. Yeah, legally. legally. But he won't, like, take care of them because it's a worthless job. Exactly. Because there's no, there's no money in it for legal reasons. Yeah, he's just doing it to keep himself from getting sued. Um, actually, funny enough, though, a lot of people out there have probably seen this building. Uh, because if you've seen the movie The Surrogates... I have not. Okay, it's the, the movie of Bruce Willis. It was based on a comic, I know what it is. an indie comic, which is really good. Um, there's a scene where they go to the slums. Mm-hmm. And this movie had a multi-million dollar budget. <laughs> they could have gone anywhere <laughs> in the world to film the shithole of the movie... And where were they for about three weeks? And everyone was freaking out because Bruce Willis was in Hopedale, Massachusetts, in the building I worked at. So the slums of that movie is where I worked for two <laughs> you years. In a literal cyberpunk slum. Yeah, that's a cyberpunk movie, right? Would uh, you not well, say? Uh, sort of. I mean, it's it's not like. So it's it's, it's kind it's of more a like a general future sci-fi kind of. Yeah, I guess I guess you could classify it as cyberpunk. It doesn't play the aesthetic very very hard. Yeah. It, it looks very kind of. It's normal. Still fucking hilarious. Yeah, that building. Every but that was the whole thing. I was like stunned. Everyone's like, "Oh my god, Bruce Willis is here! This is so amazing!" I'm like, "We we are officially the shittiest place on the planet Earth." Yeah. Like, do you understand? Yeah. Like, like like they could go anywhere. They could have filmed us in Africa if they wanted to. They came here. How many years was it between you saying that and then working there? (laughs) Um, oh god, when did that movie come out? At least five years. It was a while. That's nuts. Well, yeah, go check out Tom's building in Surrogates yeah. with Bruce Willis. I'm sure they CGI'd up it a little bit, but yeah. they didn't go that far, let me tell you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, so do you think that your life's going to be better or worse once you're out of your parents' house? Better, for sure. So you think even though even though you're going to be in a... Like living, possibly living out of a car. Would you still say that was like better like than none, things none, been? material things? Don't interest me. You know, like mm-hmm. like I'm the person that if like I made like a million dollars a year, I wouldn't have a big house. Do you think that you are going to like in the the this? You sort of talked about like being liberated by this. Um, yeah, I think you, there's just a lot of like because like the interesting thing is like you have moved around your entire life. Yeah, constantly. I went to sixth grade right down the street from where I live right now. I see. My entire life has been this tiny, tiny little fucking So you think that town. by escaping that you might open something up? I, yeah, of definitely. I like, it's, imagine. It's weird when you drive to work and you pass by your high school Yeah. at 29. Yeah, a little. Like, it's super fucking That's why, like, literally, it's, <laughs> it's funny you say that. Because, like, you know, I moved to my, my girlfriend's town, like, with the intention of getting her out of there. And, like, we pass all of her schools all the time. And she's just like, this is why we can't be here anymore. Because, right. like, every time I see that high school, I want to burn it down. Exactly. So you need to get me away from it. You so. Know? <laughs> but, yeah, I, I do think that'll help. 
Um, obviously, this just the fact that you are um, considering the possibility that it would be even better of a lifestyle doesn't mean people should give you any less money or that you don't need help. Um, I mean, I I mentioned in the wine chamber that I want people. I don't want people to give me money because they think like they they are being a charity case. Yeah. I want to make work that people think is worth right. paying for. So you you want to make sure that people know that like if you patreon.com slash save me is not about Tom needs yeah. the money. It's, it's to not live. even save me it's, anymore. I changed yeah. it to slash poly station too. Because oh, I didn't okay. I didn't want to be I think the joke kind of outlived itself at yeah. this point. Um I think it's just the kind of meme that when you push it entirely yourself, people aren't as receptive to it. Yeah. Like, I mean, Patreon.com slash Ben Saint took off, I think, more because other people were, like, pu- like propping it up more right. than uh, than him himself. Or not more so, but, like, a- a- as much. Um, your meme was too forced, yeah. unfortunately. I'm not good at comedy. I I don't think you're like bad at comedy. I'm I'm bad at like I can do like off the cuff reactionary comedy. Yeah. But I can't like sit down and script a joke. You're better at re- reacting to someone else's thing and piling onto it. I yeah. would say like on PCP, that's your funniest shit is like quips, like response quips that yeah. come out like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But uh, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, we're quick, at that point the in quick, the interview where the it's quick gone draw wordplay, and I'm trying to like remember what questions I need to ask you. Like, what do I need to know about Tom, um, or do people need to know about Tom? Um, okay, so right now you consider yourself mostly a 3D graphic artist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ever since I got, I watched We Are the Strange. Like, it's something that's always been in the back of my mind. Like, this yeah. is kind of cool, and I always thought conceptually it would be a good move to make because like the hardest thing for me to do with drawing is uh, foreshortening. Mm. Like like drawing anything in perspective is just like, uh, like that sort of shit. It's just like, like yeah, yeah, that. It's specifically that, that pose exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I've always been like, well, 3D, like that's all done for you. Cause that's like the entire nature of it. Like the extra, the but seed it's not, dimension. It's not like that, right? Well, I mean, it 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 is essentially because you don't you make the model and then you it, the camera does all the foreshortening for you. But you can't do like you can't do certain things that you think you can like that would be possible in two D. Yeah, I mean you can't like do like because like a lot of the crazy foreshortening stuff is like breaking perspective. Yeah, you can you can like fudge it for sure, and mm-hmm. you can like change camera settings and stuff to kind of get like a crazy dr- dramatic kind of depth right. of field sort of thing. Um, but just in terms of just like if I wanted to draw a person from an angle even if it's not like crazy foreshortening right. like it's difficult for me but like yeah. 3d you just do it so yeah. like it makes up for a, a weakness of mine like i think just doing the 3d that i've done like this is more how my brain thinks of like mm-hmm. objects yeah because like you you don't so much want to have to like uh draw the entire character every time you just want to put the character in the goddamn environment basically yeah. and like pose them and like i think even you more don't really need your character like you tend to draw your characters pretty consistently. They're not like extremely expressive where they're going to be changing expressions wildly from page to page or anything like right. that. Like it's safe for them to just be models that could be posed in a, in especially in like a fantasy story where, you know, like the facial expressions are not driving the story. You yeah. Know? It's not like, not like Tex Avery cartoons or anything no. like that. It's yeah. pretty restrained. Um, so it just, it works out really well. And like, I've always loved that like low poly PS2 kind of look. Yeah. I grew up with it. I mean, I don't think, I think, I think doing low poly is probably going to limit the, the reach of anything I do because I think most people, I think there's nostalgia for like eight bit. There's nostalgia for like that PS1 no, kind of thing. It's coming. The, the PS2, cause the thing is that, uh, you know, you're 29, you're not old enough to to be nostalgia baiting yet, really. I you suppose. Know? It's possible like, I'm just too ahead that, of the curve right now. Okay, because I did not grow up with any 8 or 16 big games, so I have no nostalgia for that shit. Like, for me, my era of playing those games is mostly the fucking on Steam. Like, someone like Munchie, that motherfucker was born in 2000. Like, yeah. his fir- first console was probably the fucking Wii. It was. You know? So, it was like. Disgusting. So, for someone like him, you know, he'll be nostalgic for, like, Minecraft, you know, which I mean, Minecraft looks dated anyways, but yeah. he'll be nostalgic for it because that was the the zeitgeist of the time. And I think that 
you know, I mean, obviously you got Hippo who's constantly talking about how, like, the PS2 was the best era for graphics, you know? Like, that's his whole fucking channel's identity. It's yeah. like, PS2 is the only graphics I ever want to see. So when you come out with PlayStation 2, it's like, this. there's your target audience yeah. is right there. I just there, need Hippo to give me, like, all his Patreon money, and that'll be fine. <laughs> but, uh, do you have any concerns about the idea of trying to do a fantasy story in CG? Because I've always felt that, like, one of the biggest problems I have with the Berserk movies was that, like, I thought that the extremely, like, wispy, fanciful art of the manga did not really translate to anime. But since you're not really adapting this from yeah, the I source think, material... Like, I think, I mean, you I really like... You one, one of One of the... I really like the, the, the PS2 JRPG, something like, like a Dragon Quest VIII. You're a little, something, you're a little fuzzy piece in this. You get, no, you didn't get it. Oh, God. Where is it? I don't it? know. It's not very evident, so it's hard to spot. Oh, God. Wait, you got a, a mirror, mirror right mirror. there. What the fuck is wrong with it? Oh, yeah. It's a little herpaderp. Yeah. Um, I think because it's not an adaptation, like a building the aesthetic from the ground up, I think it will probably be okay. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely be like making sure that it doesn't become too ugly or anything how like did that. you translate your drawing style into 3d because you've done your 3d art looks just like your 2d art but um the only big concession i had to make was like making the eyes a little bit smaller mm. and there were ways i could have gotten around that but uh the the thing is like i'm doing everything super low poly and like the eye socket in the model has eight points to define oh. it, so when I stretch it to that big, it looks basically like a really ugly like octagon, and it doesn't mm -hmm. look right. But when you have a smaller sort of eye, it kind of reads more yeah. smoothly. I see. Um, I could have done it as a texture, but I wanted to <coughs> give it that flexibility because the way I do all the expressions is something called shape keys. So like you have the basis of the face just kind of neutral, and then you make a new key, and then you pull the point so it looks more like an expression. And then you have a slider that kind of transitions between those two and that's how the face morphs from one expression to another okay so, so you can make the faces move and everything yeah. like in real time mm -hmm. in your comic um that's cool yeah. i don't know why i'm like impressed with that like that's not normal but i mean i, I was I like know. whoa you can make their mouths move like for in my mind that i was like reacting that yeah, strong i got like a, a thing of foss like going through a couple of different expression loops on yeah. on instagram which came out pretty um, good so Fuck, I forgot how I wanted to phrase this. So, yeah, your art style is so particular. How much of that is, like, you have to draw that way and how much of it is you want to draw that way? You know, it's interesting because now that I'm doing 3D and I feel so much more comfortable with it, like, yeah. a lot of that was just, like, this is just how it's coming out. Uh -huh. But, like, I'm doing a couple models right now that they're not, like, super different because, like, I dip... The thing, the way the 3D, like, work throw works is that you work off a reference image so you get like mm -hmm. a front and a side view and then you kind of model from both angles and right. it makes a 3d version of it and like the techniques i could apply to anything like i could get like you know anybody's art of a front and side view and i could reconstruct it right um but i'm making sure like i'm doing like bayonetta right now is like the next big model i'm working on i could just gotten like a you know from the design bible for bayonetta modeled off that but like i redrew it myself because i wanted it to be my proportions and my yeah. kind of art style so there's definitely like um i'm doing that because i feel like that's my identity and uh -huh. i like it um because I don't want to just, like, turn into, like... I don't want it to become just technical of just, like, yo, I can, right. like, recreate other people's stuff. Do you think that your, um, like, art style is going to radically shift as you one continue of, with 3D? One of the big things that is coming right now is I'm going to start using way more color. Uh -huh. I've, I've been super big into black and white forever. Yeah, your aesthetic has always been very... My big push now, because, like, what I really love about 3D is I love that, like, that low-poly, like, hand-painted. Like, World of Warcraft is so oh, fucking yeah, gorgeous. Oh, yeah, fucking great. So I'm starting to, Oh, like, if you... Dude, if you can create some... Sh like, I, your art style is pretty close to that. Like... Your Trixie pub is very World of Warcraft-ish. Yeah. Anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, there was a Trixie comic. We were talking about it before the co the camera died. Yeah. That um, that you had made this like towards the tail end of doing, like basically you quit the pony YouTube shit, and then we're like, I'm gonna do this comic, and then you worked on it for a couple of months, and then it switched over to Sorceress Lost. I yeah. guess. Yeah. Because I was um, saying in the other video, it's just like. The I, I wanted I had like this autistic obsession with keeping all my fan content like yeah. 
non-conflicting with canon uh-huh. and then like they shotgun ruined a bunch of ideas that were going to happen oh, no. like the whole story of the Trixie arc where she was going to go into the Everfree forest and find like like all this crazy shit then they like retcon like oh we're just in the Everfree and we figured out all that shit and what it is I'm like well that whole story is just torpedoed yeah. so I was just like well all, all the passion died with that <laughs> and then like the more stuff I did like the more I like kind of like was like tweaking little things like I wanted like Celestia and Luna to be made way more like gods and stuff because like yeah. I thought that was like a cool idea from the first season that they totally fucked up after yeah. that so then I was like why don't I just make my own thing where like there are gods and they are gods and they do god shit yeah so like that's what it is there's like 13 big countries and they're all ruled by a god and they all have different cultures and stuff okay and like so it just I just started running with it and like it came became way better yeah so um, I don't know if this is the same technique that you use for the motion comic of Sorceress Lost, but in the Trixie comic, while it was a two-dimensional comic, all the backgrounds were 3D environments you'd created. Yeah. That so that you could just you know put a character against a, an environment from whatever angle and just shoot it easily. Again, you're much more into just having the elements rather than having to draw them two thousand yeah. times uh, differently. Um, but. The pub is very World of Warcraft looking now that you've mentioned it. And yeah. uh, I think if you could nail that, like not just just World of Warcraft, but if you could nail an aesthetic like that, I do think people would be really attracted to that. Yeah. Well, I found out, well, I, I knew about it, but I learned how to start doing it. Like the Foss model, like I did, uh, I pay, all of that was painted directly on the model. Because there's a way of doing it. Like usually like you unwrap a model, like you put seams in it, you flatten it out like a paper craft doll. And then you like kind of like texture it on the flattened thing, and then when yeah. you put it back together, it wraps around. But like Blender has a thing where you can just take a brush and just draw right on the model on oh, the screen, yeah. so you can get a lot more subtlety going on there. Because like you don't have to like kind of like think abstract, like how will this look when it's wrapped back up? Yeah, you just like draw right on it, and like I'm just painting. I just painted the whole thing, uh-huh. and it looked really nice. And, like, I've never really done much with color, but I'm going to try experimenting more with that. And it's probably a lot faster than building a whole texture to wrap around, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's more, it's faster because it's more intuitive. Like, you yeah. don't have to, like, think, like, okay, like, part of the foot's over there, part of the yeah. arm's up here. How am I going to make them mesh together? You just, just draw. Mm-hmm. It's much more natural. Um, so that's, that's really exciting. But I'm doing a lot of experiments with that. Like, one of the first things I did, actually, I did, like, a 3D reconstruction of the first room from Undertale and oh, frisk yeah. and that was all hand painted too and that cool. looked pretty cool so i'm just like yeah yeah it's gonna be dope all right well, let's take a short break because i gotta piss and get another okay. drink and cool. we'll come right back i don't know dude all right tom <laughs> we've asked you about your influences your art your uh plans for the future do you would you say that you currently see yourself as having like a? are you living project to project or is there something like is or would you say that uh, you're more focused on the big project? Uh, in terms of like, like art art project wise. Like uh, I find myself if I'm working on a big thing, then it's like that's what I'm doing, and like there's other things that come out, but the big thing is the important thing, and other times it's just like, uh, well, it's a new week. What am I gonna make next? Yeah. Well. <sighs> My problem is that I, I flip flop constantly between like, should I run myself as a business or should I be an artist that's like destined to kill himself or something? Because because like it's so hard. Like business wise, decision. business wise, I should be like just pumping out more fan art, trying to get my name out there, build a personal brand, and like build an audience. So like when I said, oh, I'm gonna start doing original work, like I have like a thousand dollars a month based on my art, and like a huge following to actually support it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the artist in me is just like, fuck that. That stuff's never going to take off because your passion isn't in there. You should just, like, let your passion shine through on, like, something you're actually yeah. super fucking invested in, even if it's, like, a smaller thing. I mean, I think that's the way to go. But, I mean, I'm one to talk because yeah. I... I, I your, your, your passion happens to be insanely, like, marketable. Well, I, you know... Not anymore. Because, well, like, I, I found we, we myself... Can't, we can't control the audience that, that props us up, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, it's just a simple matter of that I was more willing to... Not even that I'm more willing to, but, like, less ambitious. It's like, the more ambitious you are, the harder it's going to be. It's because um, if you want to communicate a really complicated idea, then you probably can't do that in a simplistic way. Right. You know, like, it's not... You can't just 
sit down in front of a video and explain the entire plot of Sorceress Lost and have people care about Sorceress Lost. Right. You know, um, on some level they might be interested in it, but because you know, it, I've done that before. I've been like, hey, here's the plot of some novel I've got an idea for, and people are like, wow, I'd love to see that. You know, yeah. but uh, well, you're not getting it because it's just an <laughs> idea. Um, Feel free to steal it. So you're just kind of bouncing between those two yeah, extremes I'm, all the time. It's 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 complicated because like ideally in a perfect world like I wouldn't have financial obligations, you know. Because right. even the problem is like even if I like drop off the face of the earth and live in a in a van, I still have student debt. So I'm gonna have to defer on all of that. Yeah. To actually like make it work. What does that do? Uh, you basically just like like I can get like a deferment, so it's still gaining interest, but you're not required to pay it back at that point. Uh huh. So you're just basically like owing more money, so you don't have to pay it right now. Okay, but in the future you will have to pay it. Right. So you just gotta try to make it big. The thing right <laughs> now before you gotta pay the my dinner. my only scheme, but yeah. Trump Trump's sure. America seems to be on its way to ruining it is that they have a thing right now where if you're poor for 15 years, they'll forgive your federal loans. I'm like halfway through that right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and if Trump has his way, that's going to go away, and then I'm going to go fucking shoot up the White House because fuck <laughs> you, you ruined my long game here, yeah. you dick. So For what it's worth, that was satire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I've I heard know. that the Secret Service shows up yeah, at yeah, your yeah. house. If I you, mean, uh, com- half the Secret Service would support me if I did that at this the, point. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's just, I would like to just do that. Just, like, focus on that one thing. Because, like, I'm someone who's, like, really just unitask-minded. Like, yeah. I can't, like, I, I had a schedule for a while where I'd, like, on this day I'll do this project, then on this day I'll do this project, and I just end up doing nothing because my mm-hmm. brain was too scattered. Like, what I'm doing right now, which is working a little bit better, is that, like, I'm just going to do this one thing until it's done and move on to the next thing until that's done. Yeah. And I just, I don't know, simple, simple. Just, like, yeah. I'm doing this. And, and it makes it better to get stuff done. Um, what do you think is the current, like, uh, let's say six months from now, what do you think your content is going to look like? Like, what can um, people expect? Because, like, for me, um, one of the harder things about following you as a content creator is that you've changed gears so many times, I never know if you're planning to stay there. Right, no, it's, it's like, bad. Like, yeah. my personal brand's a mess. Yeah. Which was the name of that last wine chamber. My personal brand's a yeah. mess, but it's not pity. Uh, yeah, I need to just, like, really... That's why I wanted to get take the get off work and take these next couple months, like, really just, like, hammer away a game plan. Like, the, the biggest, like, fucking breakthrough of, like, the last 10 years has been, like, I enjoy making art and not just the finest, finished product, which has never yeah. happened. Like, it's, it's like... The fucking yeah, craziest the, goddamn uh, shit. Because you were saying, like, oh, you just, like, look for all these shortcuts. The shortcuts were because I hated doing it. Yeah. Now, well, that's... I mean, that's the thing, is that if you try to work in a medium that you don't enjoy doing the thing, then it's always going to fail. And the like, interesting thing it's is... fucking sucks. I'd done it for so long it. that I thought it was just because I was lazy. Yeah. But I'm not. La- I mean, no, I am lazy. But well, that's the hardest part is that like there, everybody, everybody's lazy about doing shit they don't want to do. Right. You know, and like for me, when I wanted to be an author or a filmmaker and all that stuff, like I didn't realize that when I was a teenager. Like there was a solid year and a half I wanted to be a filmmaker, and I never made any fucking films. Yeah. And at the end of that, I had to go. Well, clearly, I'm not a fucking filmmaker because I had all the time and opportunities, and like I just didn't do it. So, meanwhile, like, anime blogging was just happening, naturally, you know. And I feel like if you can find something that you just enjoy doing it and there's any way it could be marketable, it's worth exploring. And if it's not marketable, well, you got a fun hobby making fucking PS2. uh, Exactly. Well, that's, like, kind of why I want to take these couple months because, like, I have no – I'll have no responsibility, nothing else. So, if I can't do it in this situation, there's no way it's going to happen when other things are added on top of it. If you can't bust your own – so As, I mean, but, that's, they always say that like having the rug pulled out from under you is a good way to hit the ground running. I don't know if anybody's ever like premeditated that to the extent that this is though. Like, I mean, the, the whole thing is just like I I just I can't. It's really I do fantasized it. about the things that's happening to you ha- happening to me back when I was a teenager. Like I wanted to run away and thought like oh if I like. If I have to bust my ass, I'll work. Yeah. You know, um, 
but I never did, obviously. But I'm real curious if it'll. Yeah, I mean, work. ideally, like if I could get myself into one thing that I'm slowly like trying to do is like delegation and like trying to like yeah. I want to work with other people because, like I said earlier, like I bust my ass way harder than, like working for the PCP than I do for myself. Yeah, like, like I would not, not I would not you. sit down and make a hundred t-shirts for yeah. myself. Like I'll do it for PCP because it's a bigger thing that I believe in outside. Mm-hmm. But if I like doing like Poly Station Two branded shirts, I'm like just go on Redbubble, pay double. I don't give a fuck. Yeah, it also can be really, it can be way easier to just riff off of someone else's thing. You know, yeah. like it's easier to come up with ideas if it's like someone has already set up the baseline and you're just like riffing off of that baseline. It's not even like like the the idea part. It's because I when I think of myself and my work, it's uh-huh. just me. And so like because I don't think too highly of myself yet, mm-hmm. I can't get too excited about it. Yeah. But like when I work with PCP or just with anybody else, like I remember I did a project with my buddy like right after college and like we both busted our ass for a week because like and I worked hard because it was like this isn't just me. Like, yeah. it's something bigger than me now. I'm working towards something larger right. than just, like, my, like, you know, artistic masturbation. Do you think point. you're o- okay with, like, a life where it was never, like, oh, I did it all by myself? Well, like, that was a, that was something I'm letting go of. I was yeah. super obsessed with that. Like, I wouldn't want, like, I'd rather do this bad than yeah. myself than get it done right. But now I'm just, like, it's been 10 years of that and nothing's been done. So, like, now I'm just, like, I'd rather have something done than something not done. Right. I'm at a, a, at the point now where like I continually hire the Devu because even though I've been getting better as an editor, so has he, yeah. and it's like you know that that's the kind of delegation where at the time that I hired him, everyone in the PCP was terrified of hiring editors because we were all like, oh, I want to have I want it to all be my personal mark. It has to be me, me, me. It has to be like my perfect vision. But then I just found a guy who kind of understood my vision. But at the time, I was writing stuff that's nowhere near as advanced as, like, what Jesse was doing. Where Jesse was like, oh, I can't hire an editor because, like, he won't understand my vision. And right. I'm like, well, yeah, you're doing, like, a really complicated thing. Um, which is more fun to edit anyways. Like, ironically, it's more fun to edit something that forces you to be creative and, right. like, think about it. But uh, um, because of the fact that devu has been editing for me for so long that now if I do want to give him something more advanced that's like, oh, this is more of my personal vision thing, like, he can he can deliver on my vision better than I can. Right. Because I can just describe it to him and he'll show me something and I'll be like, well, that's way cooler than how I had imagined it, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's, so. the whole, that's like the advice they give you. You want to hire people better than yourself. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's what I want to do. Like, it's, it's, it really starts with just being honest. Like, I would love... Like I, my ideal situation, I'd love to do something like like Ruby, where like mm-hmm. I'm like the creative director and I'm doing like I want to still be in the trenches and like doing a lot of yeah. the modeling and like doing storyboards. Ruby right there is proof that the, that brand of PS2 model is popular. Yeah, that shit's low poly as fuck, right? Uh, the newer ones have gotten better, but the oh, yeah. the initial ones were like they were pretty rough. And like I remember watching like the first because I just watched Ruby a little while ago. And I was like, oh, my God, this is this aesthetic's on point. And then they changed to my, I was like, oh, it looks so modern. Mm-hmm. What happened? I definitely can say I like your uh, models more than the Ruby models. Well, the Ruby models were, like, what, like 10 years ago or something like uh, that at this point? Like, shit. Um, okay. Uh, well, now I want to ask you some more philosophical questions, I guess. Okay. Uh, like... You know, how do you see the world? How is the world right now? How are things? Okay. Um, like, in terms of just society and uh, stuff? How, how do you think it's going? Things going in, in a direction that you, uh, that is good. Well, okay, I don't think the direction things are going is, like, necessarily good for anybody. But, like, have you felt yourself, like, burdened with the, 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 the foibles of modern society much? Or are you more just, like, concerned about your shit? Um... I'm kind of like torn on this because like there's there's I definitely feel like I think I brought this up on a PCP episode once where I was saying how like because of social media and like the internet and stuff mm-hmm. like our our like uh, scale in which we can judge our personal ability has like been expanded like a thousand oh, fold. It's- you fucking know? that's kind of what I addressed at the start of that Dear Artist video. It's like yeah. there's so many people online who legitimately deserve to be famous and you're competing with all of them. Right. Like all of yeah. us, if we were just like new like the people in our city, we'd all be like the ninety ninth percentile of what we yeah. do. 
but it, the problem is we're, we're online and it's like I mean yeah there's a lot of you're you're in the biggest pond like yeah. I mean you can be within a sub pond of like oh well, I'm the biggest pony guy or I'm the biggest anime guy or whatever but like you know you're still a small fish in the YouTube pond of guys with millions of subscribers yeah. so you know. I mean it's the same thing with art or anything else any any niche like mm-hmm. you're just you're competing on on like a global level and the problem is because all the cream rises to the crop top. the top one percent feels like normal and so yeah. when you're not the top one percent you feel inadequate when you really shouldn't be no i mean like yeah you're constantly looking at shit that's better than yours yeah like you can't and, help uh, it but like for me the way that i process that information is i have to get as good as that guy Right. How do you feel when you see that stuff? Well, it's interesting because up until I started doing 3D, I would feel miserable. But now I just get jazzed. Like, yeah. like this is fucking dope. And for so, I guess it's just like a mindset change of just like, I feel like this medium is within my grasp. Like, I could do that yeah. with enough application of effort. Whereas with drawing and stuff, it never felt like I would get, would get there. Yeah. So or it's like that definitely your, been a big Like your shift. projects could get done within a timely enough fashion that they will make sense and be like positive experiences yeah. to have worked on. I mean, I don't know. I The big mystery for me is always like the marketing aspect because I feel like despite all the best practices and stuff, there's always a degree of luck. Like because yeah. that aspect, you can't control it. Like I can't control people coming to me. I can't control yeah. you liking what I do. And I mean, I think there's also a strong element though of like uh, – you you can't you might not be able to make them drink but you can lead the horse to water at the very least by right. like just making people understand like i think when when people talk about having a personal narrative online and everything like this has been construed as like be a vlogger and be a fun online persona but i think the main thing people just want to know is like why do you care so much about this goddamn thing well know? there's a there's a it's a great i think we had to talk about this i told you about simon sinek when he says pe- people buy why you do things, not what you do. Yeah. It's so true. It is it is definitely. I mean, yeah. my, especially for me, like a lot of my audience is about the why of like and that's why something talking about things the way I I am. really kind of want to get more into on PolyStation 2, which is kind of the reason why I kind of think maybe pivoting away from fan art. Because like if I, I think that if I did an impassioned rant or something being like how why fan art sucks or like not, not even being that blunt about it, but like why like the artistic integrity is important. I think there's a group of people that would really resonate with that. Certainly. I I also think that you, uh, yeah, if you did more original content, it would just show more. I think people want to know, like, what's the message you're trying to send? Like, I know a lot of th- random things about Sorceress Lost, but I don't know what the themes are. Yeah. You know, so that's, like, kind of the problem is I don't think enough people know what you're trying to explore with your work. You know, like... It, or even if you know what you're trying to explore with your work, do you do you have like a strong sense of like what I mean, that the, story is about? The theme the theme of of the story is actually like I guess it's ironically kind of similar to what I've been doing. Is like there's 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 another another way of do, of accomplishing what you want to do because like okay. the main thrust of it is that Sarah's in a world of mages or a culture of mages and she can't do magic. Right. And so like she wants to be like a great mage or whatever. So she goes to all these other countries outside of hers. And, like, each country has a different culture, and there's different ways of doing magic. And she kind of becomes, like, this amalgamation of all these different schools of thought and becomes, like, better and stronger that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's going to be, like, this cultural clash between her and her brother who, like, is very traditionalist from her culture and, like, how they play off each other and things like that. And, like, a lot of more more is going to happen. And is this more, like, down to earth or does this expand in, like, story scope? Like, does it, is there a war? Uh, you know? No, I, I distinctly wanted to make it not, like, a chosen one on the world on the yeah. brink of war kind of story. The entire, like, culture is stable. Okay. So it's just going to be exploring, like, these different cultures, like, being able to look at a fantasy world that's not, like, Unstable and like so on it's a closer break. to like a My Little Pony tonality, like yeah, because I mean that's where it came from. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's just like a world where I still find that so refreshing. Like there's a lot of politics and magic and everything, but it's not violent. Yeah, I mean there can be violence, like in isolated cases. Like there's a certain short story I want to tell. Like I want to like challenge like perceptions and stuff, because like she comes from this culture where magic is like 
the be all end all. And then like there's gonna be cities like where like magic's looked down upon. Like there's gonna be a whole like culture that's basically gonna be kind of like steampunk where they're like like they're basically gonna be like what atheists would be in a world where gods exist. Like fuck God, I don't want to have anything to yeah. do with them. So they reject magic because magic's like the power of the gods. So like yeah. just make technology and. But the gods are literally real. Yes, they they they're the rulers of each yeah. of each country. So. Okay. Well, that's interesting. It's more than I've ever known about the long-term plot of Sorcerer's Lost. Yeah, I mean, that's because it just kind of got finalized a little <laughs> while ago. It was a lot different before. Um, but, like, the original... one of the it was It's funny. Like, it's the original plot was going to be, like, sometimes you just, like, have to, like, realize your limitations. And I think a big problem is that because I don't believe that at all. Yeah. And so, like... No, you got to have that Gurren Lagann. Uh, yeah, we're, so... We're go beyond the impossible make the impossible possible so i was just like eh, it didn't resonate so i had to go back and scrap that and redo it yeah. and like this is and it's funny because like as i was developing the story like it happened with my own life because like 3d is i'm going to push these barriers that i couldn't do before so it's like oh yeah how yeah. badly do you wish you'd got into 3d art like four years ago <sighs> or 10 years ago well <laughs> you know the, the 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 technology has advanced to a place where like it's definitely more feasible to do it now okay. than it was then yeah. and also like there were a couple like key youtube videos that like kind of unlocked a way of doing it that mm. i kind of wrapped my brain around that if i hadn't decided to do it now i might not have stumbled across and i might not have yeah. been able to push to where i am at this point so i try like even with with like all these rewrites of sl and stuff like it, it's gonna be so much better than it would have been if I had just pushed through with it before. Yeah. So there is a part of me that's like grateful that it had extra time to incubate. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, um, people always say you have to get like your first story out there. You have to get, you have to like like Munchie was saying in the podcast you and him did. I don't know what the release order of any of this yeah, shit's no gonna idea. be, but uh, you and Munchie did a podcast about. Uh, do you know what that video is going to be called? Art Apologies. Art Apologies, yeah. In the Art Apologies um, podcast, Munchie was talking about how you need to get your early work out of the way because it's always going to be your worst, and like you can keep making it better. But then the paradox that uh, the longer you work on it, the better it gets. But in a lot of ways, you've just created multiple stories. Like by the time the the story I wrote as a as a novel, like I said originally, it was going to be a movie. I spent like two years redeveloping it until it was a book. And by that point, it was, yeah, vastly better than the pre than what it would have been. And if I made it again now, it would be too. But it would also just be another story. Like, yeah. the same characters, the same plot, but it's not the same story. You know? Right, yeah. I so, mean, I've written other stuff. So it's not like this is my first rodeo on writing a story. Right. And it's also... But I'm just saying that, like, even if none of this stuff's been published, like, right. silently in the background, you're grinding the power level, which used yeah. to be how it was. Like, sure. most people didn't crack the scene till they were of a certain power level now it's like all your old shit can be on your deviant art and some people try to cover that stuff up but i i'm one of those people yeah <laughs> all my old deviant arts are gone you'll never see them what's the farthest back of your content that's viewable online uh well i actually just axed all my pony work off of deviant art a couple mm. weeks ago so uh like two years ago it's the longest okay. it goes back um, is that true on like all social media or the okay but to clarify the reason that I decided to to get rid of the pony stuff wasn't even because I was super embarrassed by it it was because I didn't want that metadata to fuck Marketing. up with anything that's going forward because I that's still why got... I, d I, d I didn't remove my pony videos out of embarrassment either it was yeah. just like for a while I'm like an anime channel that has like three rows of anime videos and then pages of pony right. videos and I was like these all need to well, go that was the thing because like I'm rebranding as like all this 3d stuff and then you go back and there's all this pony stuff and it doesn't yeah. make any sense and like because like all these things are driven by algorithms now mm -hmm. traffic to that is gonna fuck up yeah directing where you're supposed to oh, go oh god they're ruining the internet it's really they're bad they're ruining the fucking it's internet it's really bad and the only reason that the only thing that's gonna save it is that everyone knows they're doing it yeah and that's how we can all escape um alright how long how far are we into this cause I am running out of questions <laughs> okay um well is there anything Anything, because I, I don't want to ask you about any broad topic stuff, because we talk about enough of that on the PCP, right. you know. Um, is there anything else you want to share um, I guess, audience? like, going back to what we were saying about, like, how we feel about, like, society or whatever, like, how that shit goes. I think there's a lot of negative that comes on with this whole internet shit, but like we were saying before, like, you know, the last generation couldn't do what we're doing. Like, there's no yeah. way that, like, can you imagine, 
like like the the ridiculousness of like oh like five friends are sitting around a table having this a discussion dude, and you get like almost a grand for it. I mean like the this whole setup that we're currently in right now is exceedingly strange. Yeah, it's kind like, of like ridiculous. Renting a house to make like to sh- fly six guys in and make YouTube videos for 10 days like it's utterly nuts, and definitely it couldn't have existed before yeah, this so period. I know I, we all give social media a lot of shit, but, like, I, I'm also, like, really just grateful that, like, I'm, I really, I like being the age that I am because I'm, like, young enough to be able to take advantage of all this, but old enough to understand, like, how important it is. Oh, yeah, how, like, to not take it for granted. Right. Yeah. So... But at the same time, I feel as though we are just too old to understand cert- like why things become trendy on social media. For sure, because like I understand, a like that every once in a while, um, I'll just like hear some new song that's like all over Vine, and I'm like, why? And I'm like, why this? Yeah, like, this is just is not my generation, I guess. You know, that's I, I definitely am terrified of growing old. Just because of like I'm terrified of I death mean, you gotta, in general. You gotta remember that like you know there's always people your age, like people people act like if you um, I mean granted like teenagers are the most interested in art because they need it to like understand the world around them and they have tons of free time, but like adults still consume it and they want shit for them. I'm know? just terrified of dying. Yeah, well, that's pretty bad. I mean, we're all terrified of dying. Me, I think. I think it's just because I haven't done what I want to do yet. Like, yeah. I think if I can get enough shit out of me, I'd be like, eh, if I die tomorrow, like... It, it'd take a it's lot. It's mostly on the table. Like, for me, there's so much... Well, that's that the whole I, problem. Like, it's like there's, there's, I'm never, my brain's never going to turn off. There's always going right. to be another idea. Exactly. So like, I'm, I'm going to die unfulfilled somehow. I really want you to read, um, or maybe I sent this to you. I don't even remember. Did you read a thing um, by this comic artist about like how he wasted 14 years or whatever drawing this comic that was only supposed to take five, and like his tips on how to not do that? Um, it's possibly. It's, was it's, it a YouTube video? No, it's rec- It's fairly recent. Okay. It was a it was a blog post, but it was a. I saw a video kind of similar to that. Or no, it was a YouTube video. I'm wrong. It was okay. a YouTube video. I think I watched was, that. It was like a, it, it was like kind of like an edutainment video, but it was a yeah yeah a guy who was a comic artist who had spent like an obscene amount of time over a decade drawing like this three volume comic and it was because he copied the style of like um oh yeah because he did all that super insane yeah. hatching and stuff yeah i did watch that. yeah that but then he talks about like where you need to cut to like he's like you yeah, pick your battles like this shot was not important and didn't need to be shot in a location right. that had four layers of detail uh i will not do that next time but the most fascinating part was when he was talking about like so this took me this many years, and that means that if I only do three more comics, then that, or if I if I keep doing comics at this rate, I will only get three done before I die, right. and I have more than three ideas. And uh, do you ever find yourself like, do you worry about that, especially with like Sorceress Lost? Oh, all they the going fucking as time. That's like my has? number one thing. Like I remember yesterday when I was on my way here, I was like, do I really have a week to spare? Like, should mm-hmm. I just be working right now? Because I have like two models like that have just been in limbo. Dude, I feel very similar. Because, like, two weeks, the last two weeks, I have done nothing but read the Guilty Gear wiki for this goddamn <laughs> fucking lecture. And I still have all of XR oh, to get through. For me, it was the dick show, yeah. like, days and days. And I was, like, sick of it. Like, and I, was, I didn't I was, want to I was watch talking to my friend. He's like, why the fuck are you even doing this? All fighting game stories are retarded. I'm like, yeah. I mean, you're right, but That's I said the fun I, of it. I said Kingdom I'd Hearts do it. story is retarded. Yeah. And it's got 150,000 views, so. Dude, this lecture. Or whatever, the first, yeah. The first half an hour is a hundred years before the first game because that's oh, you boy. need to know all of that. It's really dope. Oh boy! But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I too was like at the at the like very beginning of like the project that is going to define my career for the next year, and I'm like gotta not work on that yet. Let's go to Radcon. Yeah. But like, it's been really frustrating because I'm just like ah, I want to keep going on that. Right. But you're t- you've been talking about you and Munchie uh, inspiring each other to try to work here, so yeah, no, it won't I be did, a total. I, I've, those those two files have just been open yeah. for like the last two weeks. Just like, are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> God, that feeling of having it open and like, or especially if you have something for a project on a tab in your fucking Chrome. Yeah, and it's, and it's just, there for days, and or like a half finished movie, and you're just like, I'm never gonna finish this movie. It's the worst. Yeah. All right, well, 
Uh, I think we're about done here because I am sick of sitting in this chair and I've run out of questions. All right. So that's the interview with Tom. Hope you all enjoyed. Interviews are not, like, back. There's only, like, two that need to be done. It was you and Mage, I think. Yeah. And now this one's knocked out. So uh, hope you enjoyed it with video. And look forward to more RadCon video. Because there's a thousand of them. We've literally filmed like like probably over 20 vlogs today. Or 20 pieces of entertainment today. Yeah. So look forward to everything. Peace. <laughs>